This episode of the Bar Star Podcast is proudly brought to you by Louisville Music Studios, located at 4220 Trio Avenue in Louisville, Kentucky. Zip code is 40219, and the phone number for booking is 502-693-7462. Louisville Music Studios is awesome. That is where my home base is for my new secret project. And uh, they have been amazing. The staff is amazing. David Payne has worked on a really, really cool concept and brought it to life. Uh, And he is constantly making changes over there. It's an awesome place. You guys need to go check it out because not only is it an awesome place, but they're giving away something for free. David and I had a conversation and he decided to extend our offer with a two-hour minimum. If you call that number for booking to book some rehearsal time, you will get your first hour for free. Free shit. Who doesn't like free shit? We're musicians. Most of us are broke. So check them out. If you have not checked out Louisville Music Studios yet, you need to. Like I've said before, you can go in and rehearse for a couple hours. You can rehearse for an afternoon. You can set up a monthly rental so you can have a home base to work on I don't know secret projects whatever you want to so Louisville Music Studios is awesome you need to go check them out staff is amazing the gear is amazing the room is amazing I love them they love me and uh everything is just sunshine and fucking puppies oh yeah enjoy this episode of the show the bar star podcast is a show that aims for something a little different it's hosted by a drummer who thinks he's a musician but let's be honest I know and you know that drummers are not musicians, right? Or are they? Hang on a second. Who wrote this crap? This is garbage. Nobody's going to listen to a show put on by somebody they haven't heard of. Stupid. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Bar Star Podcast. I am your host, Stephen O'Reilly. I want to thank you guys for coming back once again to hang out with my dumb ass. I appreciate it. I appreciate the support. I appreciate all of it. And as you can tell, I finally have a voice. Well, my voice blows anyway, but at least it doesn't blow extra hard this week. I finally got over that shit that I had hanging around. I'm not real sure what it was, but it is gone. I hope everybody is doing well. I hope everybody had a good week. And as always, I hope you guys went out and did some shit. Please take a moment to check out my sponsors, Prophecy Inc., located in the fabulous Highlands, and Louisville Music Studios, located at 4223 Avenue. I just really wanted to say that fast. I don't really have a particular reason why. Go in the shop and mention the Bar Star Podcast, you will get 10% off your tattoo by any artist in the shop. And call the number for booking at LMS, and with a two-hour minimum, you will get your first hour of rehearsal time for free. Free shit. And don't forget to check out my website. And when you're on my website, after you buy a shit ton of t-shirts, make sure you go through Amazon using the link on my website. Take you straight to Amazon. You can bookmark that link so you can use it whenever you want to. I don't want to know what you buy because I don't really care about your sex toys and all that shit. But what that does is Amazon kicks me back just a smidge of money. Not much. Helps me put money back into the show so I can keep bringing the show to you for free every week. Today on the show, I finally got to have a conversation and have him on my show with a one Mr. Tom Knight. But he's going to have to hold on a second. Because the first thing I have to do is talk about The Dirt. I watched it. It was awesome. Everybody that's hating on that movie, go fuck yourself. Seriously, fuck off. You're trying to cram 20 years of shit into a two-hour movie, first of all. And second of all, it was a movie not a documentary. Third of all, Nikki, Tommy, Mick, and Vince were co-producers. You know that means they had the final say on a lot of shit, right? If they approved it, 
your opinion doesn't really fucking matter. So if you haven't seen it, watch it. If you have seen it and you loved it, I love you. And if you have seen it and you're hating on it, again, go fuck yourself. Now that we got that out of the way. I got to hang out via Skype. I have to say via. That's apparently the way you pronounce that word. Via. I like via. Anyway, I got to hang out via Skype with my buddy, my friend. He actually is my friend. We really are friends. Uh, In a former mentor, Tom Knight. He is also the amazing voice you hear at the beginning of my show every week that you listen. I met Tom when I went to AIM, when I went to the Atlanta Institute of Music. That's where he was a drum instructor. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. We kind of go all over the map, but this was a really cool episode. This was a really fun episode. There's a few things that you're going to notice in this episode. I hope that you can forgive me. One, when him and I recorded this, I still had a little bit of a head cold, so there's a bunch of coughs in there that I just couldn't get rid of because he was saying something important, and I didn't want to cut him off because I kind of like him. That, and he could probably kick the shit out of me. Second, there's a spot in there where I start hitting my head on the microphone. And the subject completely changes, something that we weren't even talking about. And it's because I was telling him a story that I can't tell you fuckers yet. So, I know it's there. Don't send the carrier pigeons and all that other shit to tell me there's a fuck up. It's not a fuck up. It's purposely there. I cut something out. So, we go through many stories and we talk about all kinds of things, including mainly his drumming journey and where he is today as a Emmy winning voiceover artist. That's right. He has done some amazing things. Everything he touches. And this is where I'm going to throw him under the bus. Cause I love him. Dude could shit fall back in it, stand up and smell like roses. I fucking hate you, but I really love you. Oh my God. You're so cute, but he is an awesome dude. All jokes aside, we had a great time. We had a, awesome conversation and we talk pretty regularly anyway so it's not like it was a a a once in a blue moon opportunity to catch up with each other we really do stay in touch we text each other all the time and we talk on the phone we'll have a what we call a bean conference every now and then uh this was an awesome thing for me to do and i i really appreciate him taking the time out to sit on a Skype call with me and have me record it. And uh, that's really it. I'm going to keep this open short. I'm out of here. I want you guys to enjoy this conversation that I had with my buddy, the idiot. I'm just kidding. My buddy, the one and only monster drummer, monster fucking drummer, Emmy winning voiceover artist, Mr. Tom night of a legal stand by telling people oh there it is right there it's i see it you didn't you see it saying it totally right. like the screen jumped and then i was like why did that happen oh there's a message up top steven is recording the call and mm-hmm. they fail to use any punctuation yeah well yeah or or anything else do you by chance have headphones on i do okay good yeah, that way I don't, that way be, I don't get the echo back. Yeah, you would be feeding back, and yeah, it'd be all ugly. And yeah, good. I don't want to get all that shit. Um, no, what I was gonna say is, uh, and we can start over if you want, but since this is just casual conversation, the yeah, I, I thought the same thing when I started my show, and then I had to really debate why I wanted to start it. And the biggest reason I wanted to start it is because I'm chock full of fucking wacky opinions and ideas, and that's really all I give a shit about. <laughs> of course you're going to fucking call me at 20 after 9 when I told you I was on a Skype call. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Fucking. See, man. Uh, you're, and I guess you, you're busy all the time during the day, during the week. Yeah, unfortunately, I've got the proverbial day job because music's not paying the bills right now. It'll come back around, but as of right now, it's not doing it. I got you. No, I totally get it. Mine just happens to, my day job just happens to afford me the convenience of working from home almost every day of the week and sometimes every day of the week right so yeah i can i can push back and yeah really cool 
people that I work for um, have a variety of different bosses, <laughs> nice. depending on what's going on. But but yeah, they're all like they get it. And if I gotta if I gotta push back to do a VO or an audition or podcast or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're totally cool with it, which is cool. Or a drum track, even. I mean, oh, imagine that. <laughs> oh, you you don't fucking play drums, right? I mean. All right, well, so so I don't keep you all fucking night because you and I, when we start talking, we'll just get going. So we'll actually do this. We will. Well, it, it's I mean, the it doesn't of, matter. It's the beauty of us. Bed, dude. It's all it's, good. Well, all right, fair enough. Uh, but it's the beauty of us actually fucking liking each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. No, no, it's exactly what it is. And, you know, listen, general listeners aren't going to probably get that. You know, they're not going to, the inside jokes, we'll try to keep those to a minimum. They're not going to oh, know no, our no, history no, 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 no. and the oh, 20 no, 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 no. years worth of laughter and coffee and making fun of Pat Hamilton. There you, <clears throat> there's another, there's the first inside and last inside joke. Right oh, no, it will, I, I have a rule on my show. There are no <laughs> rules. So if we have inside <laughs> jokes, they will be on the fucking show. I like hey. to call them, I like to call them Easter eggs. All right. Well, <clears throat> Easter egg God number damn one. It, Pat. Yep, sorry. <laughs> there it is. All right, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I, let me let me first start by saying I fucking love your face. That that's number one. Number oh, two, man, uh, I love your I, face also. Oh, uh, thanks. It's an ugly old face, but it's my face. Well, and mine kinda, is not exactly young. No, but you're a pretty motherfucker. Bullshit. Am I? Aren't I older than you? You are, but you're still prettier than me. Oh man. Can you tell my wife that? Could you please <laughs> just call her right now? She likes you. Like, she's like, that Steven guy, you know, the guy with the eyeliner, he's cool. <laughs> so she would listen to you. <laughs> Give me a number. I'll text her. Uh, no, you. wait. Uh, better yet, I'll message her on Instagram. There you go. That's perfect. Are so, y'all, are y'all uh, connected on Instagram? Yeah. Uh, okay. what, what is she? Brown sugar, Georgia. 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 There you go. Yeah. <laughs> You got it. Georgia brown sugar. Some that's shit. it. Something like that. Something, yeah. something like that. I am hanging out via Skype or VA if you're tattooed white trash like me uh, with my friend, my very good friend, former drum instructor, and the voice you fuckers hear every week at the beginning of my show, Tom Knight. What's up? Fortunately, that's, I didn't. That's say that that's on your that's intro. not. Yeah, that's not the voice to hear. <laughs> I was trying to come up with something like so totally unlike anything that I gave you. And that's all I could think of. That's okay. It works. That's, that's why we're friends, dude. <laughs> You're still using that old, that old thing. I, what did I even say? I don't, did you send me liners or did I just go for it and improvise? No, I, and no, I, don't I, remember. I wrote three of them and I, that's right. No, that was the one where I storm off and I'm like angry at the, script yeah. something like that yes yes like, yes yes who wrote this crap yes i had yeah right i had to like I had to yeah. do that a couple of times to make sure that the paper i had to grab a bunch more paper than i thought i was going to need to make sure that that sounded that way right no that that one is actually my favorite i <laughs> use that one the most out of the three i i rotate between the three of them but i use that one the most that's, that's my favorite cool. Well, I'm proud. I'm proud that you're still using it and that you asked in the first place. So thank you. Well, it, well, I mean, you have an amazing voice and we have we have done things for each other in the past. And granted, you've done way more for me than I've done for you, but we won't talk about that. Um, Whatever. <laughs> but you were nice enough to do that for me. And I, I appreciate it. And yes, I still use it. In fact, I've had a couple people offer to redo my intro and I'm like, no, no, what are you fucking stupid? No. No, my intro. Oh, just... that's, they, okay, I get it. Yeah, they probably they probably heard it. And we're like, okay, who's that loser? I I can do a better job than him. It's the modern day arm folding that we drummers always experienced, it, you know, exactly. twenty years ago. Yep. Sure. The the imp- I call it the impress me bro stance. <laughs> that's that's exactly what it is. It's, oh yeah, it's, so that's totally what it is. Impress me, bro. Yeah, <laughs> impress me, bro. What you got, man? What you got? That's my head hitting the <laughs> I fucking hate you. <laughs> Actually, I, honestly, I don't even think any of the stick trick shit. I've been looking at those those overhead shots and the, the, the oh newer, nice the newer videos I've been posting. Very cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, I need even to even better that shit up. 
even better, dude. It's you know because that stuff is raw. It's it, it looks unedited. It looks very real, like almost. I don't know, just straight camera phone, camera microphone. I don't know if that's what it is, but that's what it that has that feel to it. That's literally what it is. No, and that's there's something very honest and open, and I don't know that I would be. Well, I've done it a couple of times. As a matter of fact, I should I shouldn't even say that. the 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 one the one video on my Instagram account that has more view ca- is a higher view count than any of the others. And by the way, it's only like fifty two hundred. It's nothing compared to what some of these other do. Some some of my friends will get fifty two hundred views in the first three minutes of oh, posting. Yeah. I know <laughs> it's I, taken I, me a you know a couple of years, and I've gotten fifty two hundred views on this one. But it was uh it was just me. Um, I hadn't even had, I, I didn't even get my microphones out. I just had, the kit was just literally set up in the corner, never played. Right. And I just decided to crank up some BGs and, and played along to it for, Oh, I, I, I remember 30. that video. Yeah, yeah man. I remember, yeah. I remember that video that, and it's just sounded, you know, I, I just put an iPhone on a music stand and aimed it at me and hit record. I was like, Oh, fuck it. I'll post it, you know? And, um, yeah, that, Funny enough, that has gotten more views and more interaction, according to the metrics, than any of the other polished, produced, you know, multi-camera angles and all that other stuff. It's, it's, right. it's, it's funny what hits and what doesn't, man. Well, it is, and, and I'll be honest with you. I, I debated for a very, 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 very long time on even filming anything. And then I got into, well, I can get all the, the bullshit because I know enough about editing now after doing having my podcast for a year and a half or a year, whatever the fuck it's been. I know enough about editing now. I could make it clean and make it pretty and all that bullshit. And the more I thought about it, I went, I, do people really give a shit or is are people starting to finally get over the overproduced, mass-produced bullshit? And the more I thought about it, I said, fuck it. I'm going to film one groove on my phone because i have a the only thing i use different is um i have one of those little ipad holders that you can stick on a mic stand that's the only thing i did i clipped my phone with that because i don't have an iphone i got a whatever that fucking thing is a galaxy note 8 it's as big as a brick um that's what i used to hold the the phone that was it and i i edited it 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 i can't say that word i edited it it cut the beginning and the end off where i sat down and stood up and that's it i didn't fucking touch anything else and i i watched it for like 2 days over and over and over and i went all right fuck it i'm going to post it and i did and i actually i got a lot of cool responses because everybody said wow that sounds really fucking clean and i'm going it's through a cell phone microphone yeah. there's no effects on it so it kind of proved my little lame hypothesis that i had that everybody's kind of getting over the overproduction of shit and i was picking up on that when i was in the last few years at aim i left there in 2015 wow it's going to be four years this fall right we're going to talk about that shortly yeah (laughs) man sure um but but about 2013 i'll say because it was a couple years prior i started getting the sense that the videos that i was producing for them and by the way i I loved doing the work. I loved sinking into a project and letting it take weeks to produce because right. all these animations had to be built. You know, all the sound design had to be incorporated and line up with all these graphics and, oh, you know, steady cam and everything else. Well, it started to seem as streaming video was starting to arise. I'm having trouble even remembering the name. What was the name of that one? It was uh, getting a big finger. Did, can you suddenly not hear me anymore? Or? No, I can hear you. I oh, okay, okay. <laughs> wanted That's to, good. That wanted was, to flip you off. That was a nice distraction. <laughs> um, and yet, I still can't remember the name. I think it was Periscope. Periscope was oh, the name of yeah, the... Yeah, it didn't last long. No, it didn't. It, 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 for the longest time, it only did vertical video. Um, this was long before anybody else was doing it, right? And so right. Uh, I got into doing that for AIM and didn't, as usual, if you get in too early, it's just as bad as getting in too late. Nobody, there was no audience, and so, right. you know. That's but the what joke I, I make about YouTube because I was on YouTube about eight years too early. I, dude, I, I, dude, I feel the same way uh, you know, without interrupting my own story. Yeah, I, I had. Uh, well, no, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. No, I interrupted story. you. Is what happened. And then I'm gonna now re-interrupt. What is that like a double loop? Anyway, 
So <laughs> I'm so glad I'm recording all this. I'm you, gonna I was gonna say, fucking show together. Fucking. You're gonna, yeah. It's, I hate it for you. This jigsaw puzzle piece of of a show. Uh, That's all right. I will tell you this before you reinterrupt my interruption. I've gotten so good at focusing a con uh, conversation and going back to where I left off because of this show. I am a much better, I mean, I shouldn't say a much better speaker, but I'm much better at focusing shit. I know exactly where the fuck we left off. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's good. Good, 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 good. I've gotten used to it because I basically have musicians on my show and we're all fucking dumb. So one of us has to kind of, we do, we have squirrel nuts, man. It's fucking crazy. It's improvisation, man. I mean, you know, that's totally normal. jazz, dog. Sorry. (laughs) Exactly right. We're going to jazz this recording. We're going to jazz it. Okay, anyway, so you were... Well, I was just going to say, I have, you know, I, I, I screwed around with YouTube long before it was worth sharing. The, right. the video quality was horrible. I remember. And I remember wishing that it was better than it was. And I had accounts with Akamai. And for all the nerds out there, they're going to know that that's the pipe. That's the big pipe of internet connectivity right? Uh, in, this, in this country, Akamai. And... I had a service agreement with them, and I would upload all of the videos that I produced and stream them myself. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, because YouTube sucked. It, right. it, it was that bad, and I could control the quality. They didn't have any kind of HD, or well, neither did we. But at the but at the time, even their standard definition sucked compared to what I could produce and put on Akamai. So um, at some point, though, I tossed up a lot of the Adam Nitty. And some of the TLC stuff on on a YouTube channel that I don't I can't even access anymore. Like I've forgotten the password and there's no way to retreat. <laughs> so those those things are just out there forever. But but the schizo video, I think it has like twenty five thousand views. Right. And 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 I haven't checked today, but every time I look, I have I, I I have the distinct honor of not a single thumbs down. Now as soon as I say that and you push this out on the podcast some asshole is going to go out there and hit the thumbs down <laughs> just to be a shit face but as it stands currently i am honored with nothing but i think 130 or something thumbs ups and and a lot of really nice compliments um in the comment section and one of them was why doesn't this thing have a million views and i'm like dude um because i put it on here before anybody else was on this yep. and Mine, you just miss the, the tide way. you know you, you get caught in the undertow and the and the, the big waves go over your head and you're just swallowed up and it's just too damn late yep. uh and so ah what do you do man you just you know keep going <laughs> yeah it, it's i mean it's the whole what's the word i'm looking for a dollar late or a day late and a dollar short well so to to bring it back to aim what i was picking up on was okay People seem to, let's do a test. People seem to uh, respond more to instant video. I won't say live streaming, but just video that was clearly unedited, right? There was, right. A, it, it started to seem like that was more real. And the produced videos maybe were a little bit more fake. And you know what? Now that I think about it, that's probably true. Although I went way out of my way to make sure they were not fake. Um, right. You know what I mean? But that doesn't mean that people wouldn't perceive them as fake. So I was like, okay, so let's let's do a test. And so I started doing 15-second Instagram style videos because back then they did they didn't even do a minute. It was 15 seconds is all you I, got. I kind of re- I vaguely remember that. That was all you got. And yeah. so like Vic Firth had this thing where you know, hey, can you make a drum? Can you can you upload a drum groove that when the Instagram loop kicks in, it's in time? Can you? time it to where when the loop happens it doesn't disturb the groove and that's how like they were capitalizing on the shortness of oh uh, i got i see what you're gonna saying mean? like because yeah. you know it's gonna loop can you can it not interrupt the groove and i don't think anybody ever really nailed it because it's how do you know right? right well i i i started making all these videos that were one and done like literally just with the, with my cell phone and in some cases i might use the slow-mo feature and things like that but i never edited anything and man, it worked. And I'm like, okay, this is a double win. A, I don't have to work so hard on and, and overproduce these videos. And B, these little easy to make things are getting higher engagement. Right. So even the interview processes, I used to bring, I used to bring guys like 
um, well, heck, Dave Weckl and and you know a lot of the a lot of the big names we would have through there, or some of the students that have graduated that went on to do great things, you know, right? Josh Baker with Mariah Carey or whoever. I'd get those guys back in the studio. We'd green screen them. That way I could, you know, put them wherever I wanted to. I could superimpose, do all kinds of cool things. I was like, you know, no more of that. So what I started doing was I started using FaceTime. And I had a little video. This was the last set of videos that I produced before bailing. Right. And it was called FaceTime Fast Lane. And I thought it was really cool because, you know, there's a little alliteration there. And everybody knows what FaceTime is. It's the other version of Skype. It's the Apple version of Skype. Right. And um, and everybody I know has either an iPhone or an iMac or some way to use FaceTime. And um, I was able to conduct interviews with people all over the world. I think I interviewed Chris Coleman. He was in Japan or something like that. I don't know. Somewhere. Somebody was in another country. And, R- and I right. would just screen capture. I would screen capture the entire interview. I'd be sitting in front of my iMac. I would enable the iSight camera so that, and I'd have myself in the lower corner, and then the interviewee full screen. Right. And I'd ha- I I do a little quick inter- introduction. I had a list of questions, and dude, that thing would be posted within thirty minutes of the conclusion of the interview. I, I'd never done anything so fast, and those things to this day do better than the mega produced. Well, I think, multi-camera shoots with with all the editing, right? And I think it's, and I'm not, and my listeners know I'm not fucking smart. I just have, I I try I I lean on my common sense, but I think what what's happening is because I don't know what last ten years, twelve years or something, technology is going so fucking fast that I think there's just a what used to be a minority people like me that were oh fuck this i don't want to deal with this now everybody's becoming the majority because they're just they're sick of it you know what i'm saying it's almost like it's it's so inundated it's so in your face their face is in a fucking phone or a computer or a pad or a tablet all the time and at some point you kind of look around and a tree doesn't look like a tree anymore you know what i mean because I exactly everything is so fucking overproduced and i think people are starting to finally get sick of it that's my dime store philosophy on it. I, I get sick of it, and I'm not even in the techie world at all. Like I don't produce any. I mean, I produce my own podcast and shit, but that doesn't count. That's not a visual thing. But I just get tired of oh look another fucking great slick production. Look at the camera work on this. That's great, and then I just lose interest because there's there's no depth to it. Uh, on the surface, there's no depth to it and there's no feeling in it. It's the same reason why you and I have always joked for years why you like Rush and I don't like Rush. I don't think Rush sucks. Rush is an amazing band. I'll never be as good of a drummer as Neil Peart, but there's no feeling in that for me. Like, I don't feel any emotion off of that. It's it's the same thing musically as it is visually for me. And I think at, that people are starting to kind of feel the same way I am. It's just like, ugh, another fucking... 2019 Technicolor video. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and, and I mean, I don't, the thing is, I don't get it still, like to this day. I was very happy to have stumbled accidentally upon that realization while at AIM. Because again, right. it served it served two purposes. One, I got a higher engagement and, and two, it didn't require the massive amount of work. I could knock more of them out in a shorter amount of time, which was right. better for AIM. And better for me. I mean, it, it just was less stress. Yeah, know, it was a time moving. saver for you, too. Right. Now, the commercials that we aired on television, they would purchase local cable advertising slots that were very expensive. Oh, my. The amount of money they spent on just Atlanta alone. Oh, Well, it, well they worked. That's how I found out about well, it. Well, they did. Yeah, they absolutely did. <laughs> but my goodness, those needed to have production value. And so, oh, I so agree. I still, I still, yeah, I still put a hundred percent of that effort into that. No, and, um, and I think there should be a, a lot of effort put into production value. And 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 I'm not throwing you under the bus by any stretch. I know that you haven't listened to a shit ton of my episodes because you're a busy motherfucker winning Emmys and shit. But I, my listeners know I I talk about it all the time. I am a sucker for a great music production. I'm a sucker for anything that's that's slick and done well. What I don't like is when something is overproduced so hard that it's just 
it's almost impossible to even half-ass enjoy it. That's where my brain goes. If you're going to put the time and the work into something, whether it's an audio or a visual thing, and you're going to produce it, produce it fucking well. Take your time and make sure it looks good. But when you do it so much that the only thing that is possibly real was the actual script that you typed in the beginning or the end of the whatever it is, the video, fuck that. Well, then, that reminds it's me. it's overproduced. That's what drives me nuts. Here's a, here's a perfect, perfect little story to punctuate that comment. And for this, we're going to go back 16 years. <laughs> 2003, I was working with Dallas Austin, and he would routinely fly us out to L.A. for, I don't know, a week at a time or something to work on. I think one time we went out there to work on Mark Ronson, um, his records. Never heard of that guy. Samantha Ronson, Mark Ronson. It was a joke, Tom. Oh, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) It went right over your fucking head. It did, because I can't see you. (laughs) I know. Uh, I I should be able, I should have been able to tell. Loser. Anyway. Loser. He's such a loser. See, there it is. <laughs> Look at him Sons rubbing his eyes. Look at him rubbing his eyes. He's tired. No, I'm not. Have you seen the fucking size of these things? Yes. I have Couple to scratch golf balls. them. Yes. Thank Couple you. of golf balls. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah, the better to fucking see my drums <laughs> with. Hey, motherfucker. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway. So we're we're in LA and I it was one of these trips where we didn't really get a lot of actual work done. It was right. a lot of fun. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, the music business is like that, especially when you climb the ladder a little bit. Those guys, man, they know how to have fun and it's cool, right? It's also they, it's it's also a little bit easier to have fun when you have a bigger expense report. They have a lot of budgeting <laughs> room. Yes. And so, yeah, well, and but when it came time to work, man, it was work. So right. oh, absolutely. this was, but this was in between. We're just kind of messing around. And one of them had the idea. They were like, Hey man, let's mess around with this. You hear this groove we've programmed. Can you play this on the drums? We'd kind of like to have, you know, your feel like your interpretation of this groove. Right. So I, I played it they recorded it and they said, okay, well, this is perfect. But now that we've got your feel, let's put the original sounds on it. Okay, cool. So they did what I would call a line level trigger, which is where they just basically take the transient attacks of all the drums and cymbals and essentially trigger the original sounds uh, from the, from the produced beat. And, you know, voila, you get sort of a a mashup of my performance with the original sounds. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like a sound replacement, except you're only quote unquote, replacing 50% of the sounds. And and right. they, Is that what they you're actually talking about? well they it it completely replaced my parts. Oh, okay. essentially I'm, I'm, essentially I'm, I'm, turned I guess a better way to describe this without boring your listeners to tears is they would essentially turn an audio signal into a MIDI track. Uh, okay. I'm without waiting. without any quantization in order to keep the humanness, right? Right. But they replaced so, all your actual sounds with the sounds that were in there. The original the, sounds of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. of the group. Yep. Okay. So then you had my performance with their sounds. And then they had the brilliant idea to quantize that. <laughs> you end up right back where you started. You fucking started. <laughs> now, in fairness to them, this was not one of Dallas. This was somebody that just worked there, somebody local at the studio, an intern. So they are forgiven. But all right, fine. it was it was the the biggest <laughs> effort and futility, man. It I was I just I had to laugh. It's like okay, well that was fun. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, sure, I'm not sure what I got out of that, but um, but thanks it, for making it has me been try a funny to... story to tell ever since. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for making me try to um, lick my elbow ever since. And then, and then not having ever done it. Look at that shit. Look at you, man. Sorry. That's, that's bitching. Squirrels. I can't help it. It's no, that's like cool. I'm, I'm in my office and there's so many things I want to fucking show you. So yeah. where we were when we went off on this squirrel tangent and then took a left to get a coffee and then took a right and then finally came back on the interstate, we were talking about the impress me bro stance because I had a couple guys that wanted to re-record my intro. Oh. See? 
You like that, don't you, motherfucker? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't it wasn't that they thought they could do better. They just wanted to offer their services is okay. what it turned out to be. Fair enough. And I, and I asked all three of there was three different people that, that offered and I asked all three of them. I said, I'm going to ask you all three of the same questions. Two questions. One, can you write a better intro? And none of them could. I wrote that shit. And two, can you voice it better than Tom? None of them good. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Well, truth is truth. (laughs) (laughs) So what I want to say anything, you should not, sir. This is a safe space. It's all safe. (laughs) Feel free to be a fucking asshole. I'll tell you what, though. I, I am know, I still have listeners. Go ahead. What? Yeah, right. Um, no, what I was going to say is I, I'm I'm definitely flattered though that it attracted the attention of anyone that wanted to to jump in. That's mm-hmm. I see that as a compliment, really. You know, uh, I mean, unless they came out and said, "Wow, that sucked," and I think I could do better. I don't no, think they did. Nobody's though. nobody's ever said it sucks. In yeah, fact, everybody so, loves my intro, and a, a part of it that's a, that's a nice compliment. I will say that ninety percent of it and. Okay, maybe eighty five percent is your voice, and then the way I put all the shit underneath it. Uh, everybody loves the intro. I, I have people. There's a couple people that have uh, commented on my show f- on iTunes, and one of them said, uh, two actually two of them quoted two little spots of the intro. One said, "This guy thinks he's a musician." Ha ha ha. And then the other one said something like, um, uh, "He knows he's a drummer, right?" Or some shit like that. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, there's there's a couple comments on my iTunes feed where people have have quoted it. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. No, your intros are badass. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. Sorry, fucker. Um, now, what I want to know when you, because I don't, like I said earlier, I kind of throw you under the bus gently. I know you haven't listened to a shit ton of my episodes. I don't really do interviews, but I do ask a few questions. And since you and I have been friends forever, I, we could just talk about the fucking weather and be fine. But to get a show out of this, sure. When you started playing, you were in your teens, correct? Because I do not remember what Let's you told see. me. Let's uh, <clears> see. <throat> I always have to think about this. I wanted to play drums from the very beginning. Somebody on Instagram today, funny enough, asked me, how did I start? You know, I was about five or six years old, and my folks were playing In a God of Vida by Iron Butterfly, and that has a real long simple drum solo in, in the song way too long it's very long <clears throat> apparently that guy made his own drums anyway well, <laughs> <laughs> you want a real squirrel moment you know where the the title came from right in the garden of eden yeah they, they were all fucked up on lsd and none of them could talk they couldn't say it and then some <laughs> some damn fool decided to phonetically spell it out and title the album that way so anyway yes no i i'm familiar with that story but that was the beginning, and so it never really went away. And in the fourth grade, so let's see, I plus six, I'm, I guess I'm 10. Uh, in the fourth grade, I wanted to play in the band, and my dad was like, yeah, we're not going to buy a drum. We can get you a clarinet for way less money. Yeah, we're, we're not going to do that. Yeah, we're not going to no. do that. So I played, <laughs> dude, I played clarinet for fourth grade and fifth grade and i got pretty good at it like i could play the little cantina band scene from the star wars i could do that on the clarinet um i was very proud of that <clears throat> can you tell anyway uh so the so the so in the sixth grade my parents were like okay you've stuck with the clarinet all right fine and they went and traded the clarinet in and I don't know, whatever value that provided, and then got a snare drum, which I still have today. A Ludwig Superphonic, five and a quarter by 14, 10 lugs, and that was the freaking beginning. Dude, I was in the sixth grade, so I guess 12 years old, so not quite a teen. Yeah, I had the timeline wrong, but I do remember... uh, And People give me shit all the time for having a shitty memory. I've done a lot of stuff, people. Fuck off. Um, It's fine. Yeah, I know. But I do remember you still have that snare drum because you showed me that drum. Did I? Mm-hmm. Wow. When I came to your house. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, because it never it never leaves. Like it. No, because we um we you had me doing something for when you were doing your video stuff, and I don't. Me and Pratt 
came over to record oh, something. And, I know what that was. I don't remember that what was, the fuck it was. That was the show me that drum. He had come up with this idea for for something called Nighttime Academy. Yes, that's it. And yep. for for the listeners out there, I'm going to have to just self deprecate here and embarrass myself. I in 2001, I started a corporation, an S Corp, which I still have, and I named it like an idiot, Nighttime Studios. And I misspelled it on purpose. K N I G H T Y M E. What an idiot. So people are like, Nighty Me? <laughs> or or my favorite, Night, why me? Why? Why, oh God, why me? Night, why me? And then, you know, most people Fucking are like, Nighttime Studios, you. that's cool, dude. But Nighty Me, get the fuck out of here. So, you know, somebody thought it was a porn company, Nighttime, get it? I mean, like I, I've heard it all, and, and it, but it's in, it's been an incorporated name for eighteen years now. I mean, I'm not going to change it. Anyway, yeah. so Pat Hamilton was just kind of trying to come up with all these nighttime this, nighttime that, nighttime academy, and you were in the video as a, I think as a mock student. No, actually, he was the mock student. Were you the teacher? Maybe you were the teacher. I, because I was like, I, Pat ain't teaching me shit. Not even like pretend. No. Because nobody would believe so. nobody would believe it. Anybody that's ever known that guy, nobody would ever believe that he taught anyone anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so mean. He's, he he was a genuine truth. Fellow. Usually is. He was a very genuine, soft-hearted, do anything for you fellow. But yeah, there. Don't backpedal now. You know you. Well, hate him. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> I didn't hate him. There was just there was a lot of frustration, especially at the end, because he was, you know, there would be times when I'd say, dude, OK, we got hired by Yamaha to do this animation. Whatever you do, don't do this. And 10 hours later, I'd go over there and he would have done exactly that and nothing else. Right. <laughs> I'm like, OK, did did I say that wrong? Like <laughs> that, that's where you just start using reverse psychology all the fucking time. Broham, we would we would uh, we would notice one of the Hold other up. things did he would do. Did you just call me Broham? Yes, I did. Get over it. <laughs> Listen to this, Jesus Randy. Randy. <laughs> 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 so so Randy Hexter and I would walk in on Pat, and you know, in the office, and he would have been working for I don't know five six hours, and anybody that's ever done anything on a computer will understand what I'm about to say. The project was always untitled. What does that mean? If any project you're working on for hours is still untitled, that means you have yet to save it once. <laughs> yet you've been working on it for hours. So we kept trying to get him to do the right thing. Eventually, we would just go to the break room and shut the power off to the room and pretend <laughs> it was a blackout. Are you serious? Yes, and we would we'd turn it right back on, and we'd come in like nothing happened. And we he would just be in a state of absolute panic. And we'd be like, what, dude? What's going on, man? And it would it just watching him have to kind of come up with the wherewithal to admit. Down. <laughs> well, he would have to somehow scrape up the courage to admit what he had just done, despite the fact that we've been warning him, please save your work. As a matter of fact, as soon as you open the app, save it immediately before you do anything. Just mm. say, turn on autosave, anything. Fucking dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel bad that we're slamming this poor dude, but that was what we dealt with day in and day out. Mm, that and him him trying to be a mini you which annoyed the shit out of me but we're going to talk about all that shortly because yeah, yeah, how you and i met is actually i mean it's we were destined to meet obviously because i went to fucking school there and you were teaching there but mm -hmm. how we met is i actually i still tell that story to this day it's one of my favorite stories but back to you as a 12 year old playing mm -hmm. drums see you are I good you. I, you are good you. this, this is Thanks, good man Thanks. Thanks. 10 years getting everything but for now that's great <laughs> 10 years motherfucker in 10 minutes i'll forget everything i'll forget <laughs> this goddamn conversation <laughs> probably i will so well actually um it's great when i do shows and i edit them immediately 
because I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be cool. If I wait more than a day and I start to edit, I'm either pissed off because I hated the show or I'm laughing so hard that I can't get anything done. Well, I hope the latter. Oh, with you and I? Oh, yeah, we'll be fine. I have no. I I have been wanting to. to <clears throat> I've been wanting to do you for a minute, dog. Uh, um, I've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time, ever since you did the voiceovers over a year ago. But everybody knows that I'm really technology slow, so figuring out how to work this shit took me a minute, and and to work it and make it work well. You um, stuck I mean, with obviously. it though. I mean, that's more impressive than anything else is that you just didn't quit. I mean, I I don't know how many people. I, I would probably be the, one of those guys that would start and then stop. You know, it's like, I don't oh, know. Oh, you else. talking about the podcast in general? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're still doing this, man. I think mm-hmm. it's great. Shank, that I've is got 15... a proud moment. That's, that is amazing. Thank you. That's thank great. You, thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to the actual show part. Okay, so you were 12 when you got your drum that you still have that I saw at your house. Where did you go from there? Because I still have the mental picture of your ass with your borderline mullet with the oh, fucking man. Neil Pert picture behind you of him on the raft in the river, which is the dumbest fuck picture ever. I think I still have that thing somewhere. You do. It was in your office for years. Yeah. I, I was, I, I debated on stealing it once. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to fucking ruin it. I just wanted to just like it. what would happen if this thing were not yeah. here? What would he do if it, if he just walked in and his Neil Pert picture was gone? Well, so my, anyway, okay. <laughs> let me just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Slow your roll, motherfucker. I got to tell you something. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> no, um, so it, where what I'm getting at the the long form of the question is, what direction did you start to go in? Because most of my drummer friends who know of you and know who you are know that you later went into the pop and the, I don't want to use the term hip hop, but like the, the pop and the R&B kind of scene, that's sure. where you wound up. But that's not anywhere where you started. No, I, I, again, I grew up in a house, you know, with 60s and 70s parents, right? You know, and so we were always, you know, black light posters in the wall when I was five and six years old. Are you looking uh, at me right now? I'm, I see you. This is a fucking problem. Go ahead. You need a Keurig right next to the microphone, dude. Fix that shit instantly. Not a bad idea. I, I do. We, we have one on every floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I finally did buy a Keurig because of you. You, c- you talked me into it. But I also have a French press and I have two coffee pots. There you go. It's important. Okay, anyway, so you grew up in a house full of 60s and 70s. Yeah, and so we were always... I was surrounded by... You know, acid rock, rock music, blues. We did, we had a lot of Almond Brothers, you know, stuff like that. So I I grew up with easy listening rock music, and right. so that that I just felt that stuff naturally, and it was what I first started playing when I started playing drum set, right? Because that's what I grew up listening to, you know, and it's like me I, with the '80s metal shit. That's what I grew up listening to. That's where I went first. Yeah, and and I didn't. I mean, Actually, I that's a lie. I went to death metal first, but whatever. I didn't. Well, I didn't. I didn't try to go that direction. It was just what happened. And the first recording I ever made as a drummer was at a friend of mine uh, at his house, Jonathan Lawson. He was a pianist, my grade in high school. I took my drums over to his house. He set up a little recorder, just like somewhere between the drums and the piano. Right. And re-recorded an ELO song. The very first thing I ever tracked was Evil Woman, I think is the name of it. At least you picked a good one. That's a good Hey, tune. man. You know. I love um, that tune. Dude, that was the very first song I ever tracked in my entire life. You know, 12, 13 years old. At nice. a friend's house. My mom drove me over there, you know, with the drums. And I remember coming back with a tape. I, that I wish I still had. I'm still friends with him, mm. by the way, and on Facebook. Maybe he has it. Uh, <laughs> but it was the beginning. Hey, dog, I need that that's, tape. <laughs> that's kind of, I'd, I'd love to hear it. That's kind of how it all started. And, you know, you just find other people who have similar interests. And, and of course, yeah, I, somebody said, hey, here's Judas Priest. Okay, we played a couple of those tunes. And then somebody said, hey, here's Rush. You ever heard of them? No. What's that? Oh, that's, hmm. Wow, I don't get 
what that drummer's doing at all. <laughs> and 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 then this 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 massive solo that made Inagata Davida look, you know, like well, like it actually looks. And so <laughs> God, that was that was not nice. But the the YYZ exit stage left solo was just like, oh my God, okay, I, I now have a reason to exist. Yeah. There is, speaking of reasons, there are so many fucking reasons why I love you. Oh, why is that? <laughs> Nothing. That was just for me. Carry on. Oh, okay. And so for the next, you know, that was in the eighth grade, I think. Um, Jonathan Lawson. That happened in the eighth grade. And so for the next four and a half years until I was a senior in high school, I every birthday, every Christmas, or every time somebody wanted to buy me something, any opportunity I had, I said, okay, I need another symbol, another symbol stand. I need a right. drum. And I slowly but surely built almost an exact replica of Neil's kit. I mean, I, you know, two 24 inch kick drums, which he had, my Ludwig snare drum. And then starting from the left, 6, 8, 10, 12, 12, 13, 15, 16, 18. I didn't have a gong bass drum. But I did have two timbales and a glockenspiel and chimes that I borrowed from the high school. They would let me take them home for the summer. I mean, dude, I was all the way up in, you know, that. You were obsessed. Totally. And learned as many of those tunes as I could, note for note, and was very, very proud. But I'll tell you what, tell you what I think that actually did, besides solidify a lot of bad habits, which I would later have to undo. Hell, some of them I'm still undoing now. But. Yeah, we'll get to my bad habits because you had a lot to do with undoing mine. So I can't but, throw stones at you for that one, brother. Well, I'll, I'll just <laughs> I'm just gonna finish I'm gonna finish this little part of the story by saying one thing that I think really was beneficial, and I had no idea that it was happening at the time. I didn't just play these tunes. I would close my eyes and literally feel like I was on stage with the band as as. Mm -hmm. Weird as that sounds, I talk about role playing. But what I would later learn was what was really going on is that's kind of that thought manifestation idea that we're all into now. That thoughts are things, and that you're bringing right. reality, you're bending the universe kind of to to the reality that you are wanting to to happen. You're you're operating on a certain wavelength, and I'm not trying to get all weird on know. you, but you know what I'm saying. I I really think that that visualization in addition to working really, really hard at trying to perfect this craft, the visualization that I was doing along with it, I had no idea. I think it had everything to do with the confidence that I would later feel on stage. It, and when I finally got to hit it, a possible. huge stage, it felt normal. It was not a shock. It was not scary. I, it felt normal because I, I, I really feel like I almost prepared myself for it through those visualization techniques. And I had no idea I was doing that. Well, I, there, and I, I, I don't, um, I don't get too philosophical almost never. I mean, I give, uh, I joke about it being my dime store philosophies, but you and I have been friends long enough. You know how I think and act and all that shit, but there, there is a lot of truth to that. And one of my, one of my favorite people's people's Ed, you fucking douchebag. One Start of my, again. yeah, let, let me, <laughs> pick up. <laughs> We're going to punch in. Can you roll it back a couple of measures? Just, just, you know, I need like two bars of pre-roll, please. <laughs> One of my favorite musicians to actually quote is D Snyder. Um, and I don't think a lot of people give him enough credit. He, yeah. He was a cheese ball. Yeah. He did this. Yeah. He did that. And also if anybody money, he was very successful. Well, not only did he do that, he did it twice. Yeah. Um, and if you, I, you personally, Tom, if you haven't seen the documentary Twisted Fucking Sister, you need to watch it. I think I you have. Know, it has nothing to do with the whole documentary is about them up to the point where they got signed. And then that's where the documentary ends. But the reason I, I quote him a lot and I look up to a lot of the shit he believes is because one of the things he always talks about is, is PMA, positive mental attitude. Yes. And I didn't have that shit when I was a kid. And this is not playing the poor little violin for me. I often wonder sometimes, not with regret, I just wonder if I would have had a better mindset when I was younger, where I would be now. Not that I'm, again, I have no qualms with where I'm at. I say it every week on my show. I fucking love my life. My life is amazing. But I often wonder if I would have grasped that concept years ago, where would I be now? 
So I, the, the only reason I'm telling you that is because I completely agree with what you're saying and I believe in it as well. Dude, I mean, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, I don't when care. You, when you said, you know, negative or, you know, you didn't think positively or whatever negatively. Um, that was me. I, I was angry at everything all the time when I was a kid. Oh, I, you know, it was just, I was too. In, just hair trigger, um, short fuse, whatever cliche you want to attach to that. Uh, right. That was definitely me, you know, <laughs> and really with no merit. I, I I I weighed all of 130 pounds. Like, you know what I mean? Like, well, who was I to? I don't know what I thought I was going to accomplish with that rage. You know, no. just unmerited rage. Mm -hmm. First world problems. I, just, you know, but but I'm right there with you. You know, I, I dude, I screwed around. I graduated in 1986 from high school. There's how old I am. I didn't do shit until 88. Like, I literally just like thought that the world was going to unfurl its red carpet to my doorstep, partly because ugh, it's going to sound awful, but that's kind of how it felt in high school. But that's not what was really going on. My band director was just very active in placing me where I needed to be in order to win this competition or, you know, be a part of that ensemble or travel and participate in something. You know what I mean? I, right. He, he made sure I was I was always there. And that's what he's supposed to do. But that's his job. The, the the problem is somebody like me, I didn't recognize that at the time. And so I just got used to always being in the right place at the right time. And being catered to as well. Yeah, that, dude. And so when the world yeah. didn't do that for <coughs> two years in a row, I'm like, oh, well, this kind of sucks. <laughs> All my friends are like halfway through college. Some of them are halfway around the world in the service. Others actually started working and started making a lot of money and here i am like getting a tan like my whole goal was how brown can i get you know what girl was i gonna hit on at turtles records and tapes later that night you know? i mean just a complete loser like i just didn't do anything and it made no sense i had scholarship offers and everything i just didn't do i did nothing with that stuff right so so in 1988 Two years later, you know, I somehow or another, I well, I was working at Turtles Records and Tapes, funny enough that I said that. And I heard through the grapevine that Hallow's Eve was looking for a drummer. I have to tell this story since I started. No, no, no. You do. Uh, <laughs> you told me so, earlier you have no time limit. I have so, shows that have gone three hours. I have oh, no issues. So was, Hallow's Eve, I was working at Turtles and and you know, a friend of mine, Dwight from Kinetic Descent, a, another local band. He he came in and says, hey, man, Hallow's Eve's looking for a drummer. Well, Can we talk about these fucked up 80s band names for a second? Wow. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Kinet right. Kinetic Descent. That's hey, really by, all I wanted to say. By the way, Hallow's Eve, we stalked Hallow's Eve. So I was like, wait, I can go over here. This band, they're looking for a drummer? This, this, this thing that I'm holding? That, yeah. Okay, nice. well, it turns out Dwight had the information only partially right. They were looking for a drummer. Mm. Well, I got the singer's phone number. His name is Stacy. And I called Stacy as soon as I got home. And he said, yeah, man, we already got somebody. I was like, oh, well, they were looking for a drummer, but I'm too late with the info. So being that angry fool, I just kept calling back and just being like, I don't care who you have. He sucks. And you're an idiot if you don't hire me. Like, what in the... What was I doing? Well, you were being Tom fucking Knight. What you were doing? I was so, I was well. I was like, I got nothing to lose, and isn't that funny? How sometimes that works. I, I was like, screw it. I already don't have the job. What's he gonna do? Well, what he did was he sent the guitar player over to my house, um, uh, not unannounced. I had about a day's notification, so I had to quickly learn some of these. <laughs> songs by the way i hadn't learned anything i just was just saying all that stuff <laughs> and dude shows up his name is dave stewart we are still friends to this day he's a real estate agent um nice. anyway so he comes over with his amp and guitar and we burn through a bunch of tunes he didn't say a word he just he's like all right man cool i'm gonna i'm gonna take off didn't say nothing and 
A couple days later, I got invited to rehearse too much, or RTM, as the Atlantans will remember it. And it was a day that Halsey was rehearsing for the tour that the drummer was not there. Okay, they had a regular schedule of rehearsals, and right. they which days the drummer would not be there. And they invited me down on one of those days when the other guy was his name was Paul, when Paul was not going to be there. So I auditioned on Paul's drums <laughs> in the <laughs> studio, and I Stacy the singer was the last guy to get there, and we were in the middle of playing "No Sanctuary," my favorite all time favorite Hallow's Eve song. Right. And because it was my favorite, I was just, I felt every bit of it and was probably playing it. I was probably over exuberant with what I was doing. But Stacy comes busting in. He was like, oh my God, you're hired. Got the job right then and there. No shit. <laughs> yes. And they had to send that poor guy back home. He lived in Baltimore. Ooh. And a week later, we hit the road, dude. So strangely enough, that negative anger and hostility and resentment and all that stuff that I felt as a kid actually worked for me on that one particular job, but I still would highly discourage. <laughs> that well, act. yeah, there, there is that. Nobody wants to work with a douchebag. Nobody wants to work with an asshole. Well, let me tell you what, what, the, what ended up last thing. So after the rehearsal, we were all sitting there and it was a done deal. And Stacy told me, he says, look, man, we sent, Dave, the guitarist, over to your house because of everything you were saying. And if you sucked, we were going to invite you here and kick your ass. <laughs> Thankfully for all of us, you didn't suck. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> Just so you know, we were going to kick the shit out of you. Dude, like, because I, the stuff I was leaving on his voicemail was just not kind. <laughs> no. So, so... <laughs> if they would have kicked your ass, you would have deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I like how you didn't hesitate. Yeah. Absolutely, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's how stupid I was. Like, I just li literally couldn't see the consequences of that behavior at that time. Idiot. Mm. It worked out for my... What's the way to say that? It worked out. It worked to your advantage. Just, just, it worked to my advantage. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why... I, Got a brain fart on that. It worked to my advantage, but I, I could not see past my desire. And yeah, the consequences were just, they weren't there. No, it's, it's always that, um, it always seems to be that last ditch effort or the, the guy or girl that has nothing to lose are usually the, the, um, the ones you have to worry about the most because right. uh, somebody that has nothing to lose, they don't give a fuck. They don't at all. <laughs> Listen, my my loyal listeners have, have listened to enough of my fucking rambling, but you were literally. I'll explain that later. I heard uh, the podcast. It's all good. You know, I got you. Good, 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 good. I got good, you. Good, 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 good. Uh, you were literally there when I went through all my bullshit with my ex-wife. So you saw my anger firsthand. And I was, what was I, 20? I was 30. I graduated when I was 30. So, yeah, yeah, I was 30. No, wait, was I 30 or 31? Doesn't matter. Somewhere in my 30s. So you got to see all that shit. And when I, I had nothing to lose, but I had everything to lose because I, would, I wasn't sure where my fucking life was going to go. So I get it. This is the point I'm telling you. I've gone mm -hmm. through it in the young teenage angst, and then I went through it as a holy fuck, my life's about to start over angst. Angst. That's the word I was looking for 10 minutes ago. Thank you. You're welcome. Here, let me just say angst a bunch of times, and you can say angst. 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 <laughs> angst. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then you could just fucking paste that shit in. <laughs> All right, anyway. Let me shut up. I mean, honestly, dude, there's nothing, you know, I don't want to turn your podcasts into one of those overproduced things. We were talking about how much we <laughs> in the beginning. But there's nothing stopping you from just, like, Long after the thing is over, you getting on that mic and just fucking saying a sentence completely like on your own and then sticking it in there like it was always there. Oh, I've done that before. Hey, there you go. All right, then. Oh, yeah, I've done that. I've, <laughs> I've done that before. Cut it up. We Sometimes stuck it in you there. just got to make yourself sound better. Dude. And, and I hate my I hate the sound. I still hate the sound of my own voice. I mean, I'm used to it now. I've been doing enough shows. That was the biggest hurdle for me to get over. The two biggest hurdles for me were learning the technology and 
getting over the sound of my voice. I, I, I everybody hates it. Their own voice. I mean, you don't because. Well, no, I did for a long time. I mean, no, I'm saying you don't now. Like, yeah. even though I've been doing this for uh, over a year, I still don't like the sound of my voice. Um, but I, I'm w- much more used to it now than I was. It it is it is a process, mm. and I don't know when it changed for me, but at some point I'm like, oh, I think what happens when you won that motherfucking Emmy. Well, <laughs> believe it or not, it was a lot. It was a long time before that. Um, I what ended up happening. The reason I hated my voice is because I couldn't get it to sound like I wanted it to sound. And then at some point that changed and I started figuring out like you do anything. If you Mm -hmm. do it long enough, you start figuring out what it is you have to do or what it was you weren't doing before that you need to do. And all of a sudden I was getting the right sound from my recordings. And I I don't know. I don't know how that works, but. The difference between the way you hear yourself and then the recorded version of yourself disappears. Now, you're, you are a million percent right, because once I learned the software and all the shit that I had to do my show, and you've heard enough of them, they're, I will, I'm totally patting myself on the back right now. Do it. You can see it. You do can it. see it. You can see yep. it. I can. Do it. The quality of my shows is fucking amazing. Um, I, I, I will put it up against any quote pro podcaster. Uh, but once I got used to all the software and all that shit and I started listening back to it, I went, that fucking sounds really goddamn good. It does. I, I don't have anything to complain about. It does sound good. I mean, the very first one I ever heard, which was the first one, sounded good. Which, and that one I hate. I still See what I'm saying? I hate that episode. Oh, yeah, I hate that I episode. I get you. But I, so so if, if that sounded good, I can't imagine what they sound like now. Oh yeah, they they sound really fucking good now because I've got it down kind of to a science, um, gotcha. and all that shit. Back on track. Yeah. So, when did you get out of the hollow? Well, first of all, how long were you on tour with Hollow's Eve? And not, then not that when, long. When did you get out of that and go to? Because if I'm not mistaken, and you will correct me because your memory is way better than mine. Did you go to Skin Deep? Which I still listen to that fucking record, by the way. Oh, I'm so glad you have a copy of it. Good. Yeah, um, you gave it to me. Excellent. So I summer. Made you. I forced you. I sat in your lap one day and I said, "Give me a copy of that record, or I'm going to pee on you." That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> Total fucking lie. I did not so, do that. Yes, you did. So. <laughs> you're right. I probably did do that. All right. So Hallow's Eve, the monument tour, which was the name of the record, monument. Mm-hmm. That happened in 1988, and it was over, oh, man, in just a couple of months, dude. We we hit a lot of cities on the East Coast, way up the East Coast in you know, Poughkeepsie, and, you know, and then we ended up in San Jose, California. I think it was the very last show. Damn, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we went all over the place, here. man. Oh, man, and the, the stories I could <laughs> belabor you with. Suffice it to say, I was done with that gig by the time we got there. And right. the very last thing that happened was we were in ha- San Jose. We had some guy, I think from Pennsylvania who had just decided to be our driver driving our van. We were in a van, not a tour bus, a van with a U-Haul carrying all our gear. And the dude ran a stop sign with all of us in it and plowed into some little old lady in a car. And, you know, nobody got hurt, but, it screwed up the rest of that day, and I th- I don't think we made the gig, you know, because we suddenly didn't have a ride, and I think they arrested that dude. No shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I called my father, and I was like, hey, man, can you get me out of here? Can you just buy a ticket? I will find a way to LAX. And right. he did, man. He paid like 600 bucks in 1988. That's Which a is how lot much of it, fucking money uh, back then, right? Thirty-one years ago, or whatever that. I guess that's yeah, thirty-one years ago. So, uh, I couldn't sleep. I was so ready to be home, and I didn't tell the band I was bailing. You like, just left them. I well, we were coming home. Like everybody was gonna. That was the end of the tour. Oh, so, so, so you didn't. You didn't I, leave I didn't, them with gigs didn't, on the boat. I didn't. No, no, no. I didn't leave them high and dry. But gotcha. I just. I did not want to trek back across the country with them. It was going to take a week. 
Yuma Desert temperatures are in the hundred and teens. A <laughs> hundred too many. I, 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 dude, I'm telling you. And, and you know, they had little signs on the side of the road that they would, you know, the state patrol people would like go out there and like manually move this needle, this wooden needle on these signs, talking about, you know, the chances for spontaneous combustion of tumbleweed would be that. low, medium, or high because of the extreme dry heat. Um, man, I didn't want to, and it was in the August. I, no, I, you know, <laughs> I'd already paid my dues with these guys. Right. And I'm, I'm, they're cool dudes. I'm not trying to make them sound bad. It's just the circumstances. I was done. Wasn't making right. any money. The only money I made on that tour was per diem. I never made any real money. Like I didn't get paid as the drummer. I was the drummer. I didn't get paid as the drummer. The only thing I made on that money on that gig was, was per diem. $25 a day is all it was. Right. And that's it. And so I was like, fuck this. So yeah, I flew back home. And what I didn't tell them was that that was it. Like if they were planning on any other dates, they were going to have to get somebody else. And they did. Right. Um, but I just didn't tell them because I was, I was actually worried they were going to like trash my drums or leave them in California. You know what I mean? Like just out of spite. Right. So you don't say anything. You're just like, ah, I got a ride. Uh, my dad's flying me home. I'm good. I'll see you there. And a week later when they pulled up, I went over there and picked up my drums under the guise of cleaning them and changing the heads and all kinds of stuff so that it seemed, Legit. you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And just fucking bailed. <laughs> I'm not leaving. I'm just, I just need my rig. Yeah. I, I knew what I was doing, but I, I, I also knew that I wasn't hurting them. Like there was no other dates at the time that was set. Now, shortly thereafter, they planned on going to Canada and that's when they, you know what they did? They called Paul. The original drummer, they just got him back. That's a, oh, that's what nice. happened. Everything kept going. Yeah, everything. They didn't skip a beat. Well, because they stayed around for a while, right? They're still around. Uh, Tommy Anderson, the bass player, is the, the only original. I'm not kidding you. He's the only original member, but they are still hitting it, dude. I think. <laughs> you know what? I haven't looked this year, but man, yeah. Every time I would get on Facebook, I'd see, you know, Hallow's Eve gigs. I met the, the drummer. Really cool guy, great drummer, but yeah, n none of the original dudes, except for that, except for the bassist. That's fucking crazy. Well, is that coming off of that tour? Is that where you kind of changed your musical direction? Well, after that, you know, or was that a happy accident? It was a happy accident because my my family was like, okay, it's been two years since you graduated high school, you didn't do anything, and then when you did, it ended in disaster. <laughs> You had so, to do something for real, kid. So you're going to go to school. And they were like, Georgia State seems appropriate. And I said, sounds good to me. So my dad walked me, you know, down to Georgia State. And like literally, he had already been there. And so he knew where, where to take me. And I just kind of walked me through like a counselor. Got signed up and off to the races, man. And I spent a couple of years there. I didn't quite finish an associate. But that's when I discovered Weckl. Wow. Mm. Somebody, somebody played me, you know, spur of the moment. I think it was Terry Vineyard, friend of mine, still buddies. I can't believe you fucking remember all these names. Yeah. Terry Vineyard, man. He, I'll never forget. He, he, we were in Jack Bell's office and he goes, man, you got to hear this. And about halfway through the song, I was like, holy crap, man. I've never heard anybody program a drum machine quite so intricately. And he was like, yeah, that's a dude. That's not. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, What? So it was that same <laughs> moment that I had, you know, five or six Wait, years earlier. What? Yeah, or, or, yeah, five or six, or maybe seven years earlier when I'd first heard, you know, Neil's solo on Exit Stage Left. I had the same vibe again. I was like, oh my God, I thought I, after all this work, I can finally play, you know, the Neil Pert solo and... But now this, oh, it's like it's like getting to the top of Mount Everest and realizing you're really just at the base of another mountain, right? And, you know, I'm like fuck, this sucks. And I was instantly mad, but uber motivated. And right. I set out. My mission was to learn that song from that moment. And about three months later, I had it charted out. I still have those charts, dude. Still got them showed him to Weckl. I'm going to brag for a minute. I had Dave Weckl at my house last Saturday. You did. I saw that. I picture. did, dude. And, and I saw uh, that. I regret that I didn't show him those charts. So I just took a picture and sent them to him. 
But anyway, I, I hand charted that shit out and it took three months to get every note right. And, uh, and then I had to learn it. Just charting it wasn't the same as being able to play it. Right. And made it slightly easier, but yeah, well, I, you know, so I spent another three months and, and I remember showing the charts and playing what I had learned to Jack Bell. And he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to print this 200 times and we're going to hand it out with the programs to the next percussion ensemble recital. You're going to play that piece. No shit. Yeah, dude. <laughs> so I don't know this story, bro. And, and I mean, somewhere there's a recording of it, but, but I, like I say, I still have the handwritten. I think actually these may be copies of the handwritten, but I mean, you can't tell it. it they look right. Like, yeah, it looks like it's my handwriting on my little custom staff paper with my name at the bottom and everything else. And right. I was trying to be official back then, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's real neat. Like you can tell I took, I, I was so, I was taking such care to try and draw the notes all perfect. And it, you know, it's like the best handwriting I ever had on those charts. <laughs> One time. One time only. <laughs> right. Everything else was just going to be like a, a freaking doctor's prescription signature. You know? <laughs> That's what they look like now. But if you, I'll send it. I'll <laughs> yeah, your, your handwriting is shit. It sucks. But the, but those notes, man, they look good. And it's accurate. Although I think Terry Vineyard did find, if I'm not mistaken, I think he found a, an inadvertent 5-4 bar that, where I just blew it and like wrote a note twice in there. And he's like, you know, you got five quarter notes in here. No, I don't. Oh, shit. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I, and I don't even think I changed it. I was like, well, I know what it is. So <laughs> I'm talking about Easter. It, it's gonna, yeah, it's going to stay there forever. Dude, I'm not rewriting this. This was not done on a computer. <laughs> yeah, this was done by, you see this? That's, that's, that's what happened right there. I would have that to start from claw. the beginning again. I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that thing? Yeah, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was my induction, and and that was kind of the beginning of the idea that wow, okay, there's more to drumming than rock and jazz. Right. Uh, there was there was funk and Latin and fusion where you put those things together, and and you know, not not that rock and jazz is limiting, but that's just the, those are the only two styles I had any experience with. Right. And and when I say jazz, I mean like big band jazz. My teacher in high school, Melvin Hodges, was a huge big band fan. So, you know, we were always playing Buddy Rich. I mean, I knew who Buddy Rich was, and I was fascinated with his abilities. Right. And tried to learn as much of what he could do uh, as I could possibly figure out. But he was so fast, I just didn't, at the time, had no idea, like, I didn't know how to interpret it. I was like, well, wow. Okay, yeah, never that's mind. Yeah, super fast. Fuck that. I'm done. Now, <laughs> I, now I get it time i was like okay um i'll take whatever i can from him but but neil was actually easier to figure out <laughs> than buddy <laughs> I am mine. Yeah. well i think that was also i think a lot of that also had to do with the how fast he was and the type of recording equipment they had back in the day because you couldn't get any precision out of the recordings it was all fuzz because he was so fucking fast and there were music videos for Rush where I couldn't, I didn't know where to find videos of Buddy playing. I got it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, just yeah. saying that sounds funny back then. Like, there were, I don't think DCI was putting out instructional videos even back then, were they? I, we had Jamie Abersol tapes. You know, the, the guy, one, two. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. I think DCI started late 80s, early 90s. So, that's yeah. where my head goes, but everybody knows my memory so blows, so I wouldn't bank on that I, shit. Yeah, at the time I had no idea. So so I couldn't even see. At least I could see a music video um of Rush. Right. An MTV, which started I think in eighty two. So, you know, well within the time of my, my high school playing, I could right. watch Big Money. I could watch Limelight. I could watch subdivisions or whatever video you know and and just live for the few short moments where neil would be on camera and go oh okay that's how he did that okay i can see it right you know what i mean and you yeah. sort of start figuring it out that way but we with, with, with buddy you couldn't do that no that's that's definitely true i think for us 
and you and I have talked about this several, several times. Um, I think for us, I don't want to say we had it better because that's the wrong word, but I definitely think, and I'm comparing it, comparing it to kids now and, and young adults now, but I think for us, we had a slight advantage because it made us work harder. Oh my God. Yes. You know There's what I mean? Also more magic in it. I mean, there was more what? You, and there was more magic in it. Didn't you use oh, to, yeah. did you buy an album and then pull the sleeve out and read the liner notes when you had your headphones on, totally immerse mm-hmm. yourself in it. And the, the order of the record was what it was. Mm-hmm. And unless you lifted the needle, you were going to hear it the way the producer, not even the band, but the producer wanted you to fucking hear that record. Yes. And the producer back then, like Terry Brown and these guys, they were a, an integral part of the band. Oh, they absolutely. They, they were, and they weren't, a, they weren't a bunch of them. There was one that would stick with them for decades. Mm-hmm. You know, such magical times that I, I'm not mad at the youth. I just, oh, I, I'm not I, either. You know what I mean? But I feel bad for them that they, that that little bit of history, they don't really get to experience the way we did. No. And the, and the other thing, and it's part of the reason why I I stopped teaching was they don't care. And that started to, that uh, there's a myriad of reasons why I quit teaching, but that was one of the things that started to really annoy me is, well, that shit's fucking old. Nobody cares. Um, that actually, that's the, 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 the most bullshit answer I think I've ever fucking heard <laughs> because none of the garbage you listen to now would exist if it wasn't for quote the old fuckers. And they did shit so different back then you would have, I mean, there would be no, well, I don't want to go out that far and say there would be no Metallica, but Metallica as people knew them would not exist if it wasn't for Bob Rock. He took them and said, okay, your songs are great, but we're going to do this. And that, I forget if it was Injustice or the one after that. But one of those records, the one that put him over the fucking map, that was all Bob Rock. Bob I Rock think it was Injustice record. for All. Wasn't that the, that was the 88, I think? I think yeah, that the was one, the big the one. one with no bass on it that everybody hates now. The clicky, which I think the is, clicky kick drums. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, but that's the one. But no record sounded like that at the time. Right. Nothing sounded like that at the time. And that was the shit that put him over the edge. It wasn't just the band. I mean, yes, Metallica's good, and I'm not even a huge Metallica fan. I was back in the day. I'm just using them for an example because if Bob Rock hadn't have walked in or they hadn't have hired Bob Rock, I don't think they would have gone the on the tra- trajectory as fast as they did. They would have still eventually got to where they are, I'm sure, but I think it would have taken a different path, and it probably would have taken them a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Bob Rock is the one that helped make them what they are, in my opinion. And there's a shit ton of producers that are like that. I mean, think of all the people that Rick Rubin fixed, so to speak. All right. Guys like that, they just... And there's nothing, there's nothing like that magic like you were talking about and the other part is now you have a million motherfuckers that say, I'm a producer. What are you producing? Your ears blow. Get the fuck out of my face with that shit. And see, I, I have to say, I, man, I don't have a lot to say about stuff like that because I don't <laughs> know. You know what I mean? Like, my experience is so narrow. I'm just going to call it what it is. Right. Like, I, my experiences as a drummer or just as a music fan have always been super narrow and not very cultured, um, not really that refined. I would just fall into something that I loved and then I, I would dive in and I wouldn't think about anything else. Right. And so, but there were, I always had friends. In fact, most of my musician friends are the exact opposite. They, they know everything there is to know about all the gear and like who did what on what record and who produced right. this. And that. I'm the I'm like the idiot in the room that doesn't know any of that stuff. Right. Like, I, I had to um I didn't have to. Dave Weckel asked to borrow my drums for the tour last week and I was happy to provide them. Right. Um but he's asking me all these questions. I'm like, I don't fucking know what these things are. I don't you know, he's asking me <laughs> like model numbers and shit. I'm like, I don't know what they are. Yeah, but a lot of people are like, Oh yes, well this is the 700 series. I don't know. I don't, I never know stuff like that. So I'm kind of the, I kind of go dark when we, whenever the conversation starts going in the direction of gear or gosh, I mean, 
even even things like what you're just talking about where people are producing I know I know Rick Rubin was huge. I don't know anything about Metallica. Uh, Terry Brown I think was the was the producer for Rush, but I might even be wrong about that. Clueless. Right. Well, you know, I, I just know a, I don't know a shit ton about it, but I know enough to be dangerous because I I started getting into production values. Fuck, I don't even know when it doesn't matter. Um and I I learned a few of the quote key players like the Bob Rocks and the Rick Rubin mm-hmm. and shit like that. But I, I'm like you to a degree, I'm not as narrow focused as you, um, but I, I'm still like you to a degree because I I can take my drums apart and do all that bullshit. But as far as I don't know what the fucking serial number is of my drums, I don't know what series it was when it was stamped and all that shit. I don't fucking know all that garbage, um, and I don't know who produced this record and that record and this record. But there are, like I said, there's a few key ones. But the only reason I brought that up though is whether you know a lot about that shit or not, mm-hmm. I, I think you would agree that a lot of that is lost. Like you said, the magic is gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? The experience. Well, we we couldn't... First of all, none of the kids today will remember or will know what it's like to hear a song on the radio and not know what it is, not know who it is, That's and true. be deathly afraid that they'll never hear it again and forget how it went. Mm-hmm. knowing that this awesome song they just heard is gone forever until you yep. hear it again. Yep. That nobody knows what that's like now because of Shav- Sh- Shazam. I can't even say it, but I use the app. I love it because it prevents the very issue I just described, but we grew up in a time when that didn't happen. So, so if the, if the right. DJ didn't say the name of the song or the band, you were hosed dude. And you were pissed. There was no, right, there was no website you could log on to mm-hmm. and look at their playlist. Nothing. Nope. Nope. You just missed out. Unless somebody standing near you happened to know what it was. You know what I mean? You were just oh, yeah. you were out of luck. And then even you know exactly if you did, what you mean. even when you found out, I couldn't drive, had to wait for mom to <laughs> find time in her schedule <laughs> to cart my ass up to Oz Records and Tapes or Turtles or Peaches or wherever. And hopefully, and, pay and for hope, it too. well, and hope that it was there because mm-hmm. they could be sold out. I'm sorry, that made the process of enjoying music so much more. I hate to say it, but it made it so much more meaningful. No, I, dude, I agree. I, I agree. Uh, I couldn't agree fucking more. I agree 100 <laughs> percent. Because, well, it, it's funny. Um, you see where that basket is over my left shoulder? Uh, I have where the, this where the lamp is. Hang on a second. Let me skip the tutorial. Okay, now I can see it. All right, see that? Uh, yes, I do see this bright light. Yes. Okay, so the basket is sitting on a four and a half foot tall military grade file cabinet. Oh, right on. Okay. Guess what's in it? I'm going to say LPs. No, CDs. No? Oh, CDs. Okay, yeah, okay, CDs, cool. CDs. I, 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 I went back, I but not, not, I, I went a little too far. Well, I, I never got back into vinyl just because i can't take it with me so i've just always kept my cds but the point is i still buy cds i when i can't go buy a cd i get pissed um and don't get me wrong i'm i'm not a a fucking dinosaur i mean i have to use digital stuff for all the shit that i do and all that crap but the reason i'm pointing that out is i will never get rid of them i still buy them and i still get excited when i go because Louisville has three or four used record stores that are actually really cool. Um, one of them is vinyl only. Um, when I go to the used record stores and then I go to Best Buy, who's apparently not going to sell CDs anymore, which is a sad thing, but mm. whatever. Um, I still get excited when I'm like, oh, fuck, I used to have this. Or, oh, God, I've been looking for this forever. I still get excited, even at 44. I love buying records, and I do the same thing I did when I was a kid. I open the damn thing, I put it in the player, and I start fucking reading the liner notes every time. Damn and, right. And no, that process of doing that, I think is – obviously, kids don't do it anymore. But I think it's a process that if kids would actually do it, they would enjoy it. It would it would be a lot more meaningful, like you said. I just – you know, I'm I'm okay with instant access – I mean, it's it's definitely very handy, mm-hmm. um, you know, working on a video and I need a piece of, you know, music because a client wants, you know, some Justin Bieber tune or something like that. You know, OK, cool. Download and let them deal with the copyright problem. 
Yeah, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just doing what I'm told and you know, it's on their, it's on their shoulders, but I, I don't have to wait, right? I can make money very, very quickly. Right. I get the benefit and the value and I'm not, again, I'm not upset. At, I just, since we're talking about it, yeah, that's, that's something that, you know, and, and, and maybe if they're hearing this, they'd be like, yeah, whatever. I, I, I'm glad I don't have to do that. And, and so it might be one of those things that right. because they didn't go through it. It they doesn't don't, matter to them. It's not going to matter. Right. And, and it, you can't be mad at that either. Right. No, because it, and it's not. Look at me, us. Yeah, exactly. It, it, and for me, it's not I'm not mad about it. I'm not mad at it. It's there's there's a slight sadness and a slight disappointment because it's it's something cool that they'll never get to experience. It just makes me think of my elders. Mm -hmm. Right. They my grand dad could always tell me about times long gone that I would never understand. And right. no matter how passionately he would tell the story, I'd never understood it. Like I conceptually right. understood the meaning of the words he was saying, but from an emotive emotional standpoint, I, yeah, I could not really relate. I could only get that he was passionate about it right. and that he really feels bad that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't take me th for a walk in that time. And right. that's kind of what I think we're doing now is that we're just sort of, you know, again, not being mean about it. We're not mad at them. And you're not, I know you're not either, but yeah, we're just sort of like, we, we have that, I hate to say it, but we're just, we've lived long enough to where right. we can now feel bad that we can't grab these kids and whisk them back and let them feel what we felt. Right. Cause we I know they'd love it. Oh, absolutely. Any anybody that that doesn't that didn't like that process or or even going to to an actual here's one for you. You'll like this. Going to a ticket master service center yes. to buy your tickets for a show. And they were everywhere. They were in grocery stores, they were in drug stores, they were in convenience stores. We you had one go, at Turtles. Yeah. And they were, obviously, they were in all the record stores. And they may not even been the service centers. I forgot what they were called. Ticketmaster something. Um, kiosk. <laughs> something. We'll call it didn't they, kiosk. Didn't they have them like an ATM for a while? Or Yeah. I'm just imagining yeah, that. No, 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 no. You could do an ATM as well. Um, but you, they'll never know what it was like to actually, holy shit, I got to get my ass down to fuck sticks it's drugs. camp out for tickets, dude. Yeah, because the tickets are going on sale tomorrow. Yeah, I got to get over you, there. It was like, you know, people talk about Black Friday. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. It, That was how it was for us. That's a, yep. an easy way to get people to understand how it used to be for tickets. Yep, absolutely. You, you camped out. Yep, you damn you either sure camped out. Somebody or you somebody. Or you blew somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you had Sorry, friends at radio easy. stations. <laughs> you know, I had buddies like Alan Ayo and Delia Ray. These were two people that, that I, was, I was good friends with in the late 80s. I'm sorry, that's not true. In the early 90s, I met them when I was with Skin Deep. But that kind of thing was still happening, you know. And sometimes I could, you know, lean on my buddy Alan for, hey, man, you guys get any comp seats, man? Yeah. <laughs> brother up. Yeah, man. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't have you any kind of connection like phone that. Out. Yeah, now you flip your phone out, you hit go, and you have a ticket. Right. And okay. then you get to the venue, and you fucking show them your phone. <sighs> Tom, you know what this means. You know what this means, right? We're officially old fucks. I, that's why I said a minute ago. Yeah, we are. We've been around long enough to where we can now lament the past. Feel bad for the kids that didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Back in my day, I tell you, <laughs> man, we had to walk uphill to the gig both directions, barefoot in the snow, and we liked it. With a kick drum on our back. <laughs> well, I yeah. love you. I love we, didn't you so have any, we didn't have any newfangled music. <laughs> we had to memorize everything. That was a really bad Tom Anderson impression. I don't care. Hank, Hank, Hill. Hank Hill is really. I, I don't give a shit. It was funny. It made me laugh. Okay. So, Skin Deep. How did that right. come about? Was so, that after you, you got obsessed with Weckle? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, that happened as soon as I got to Georgia State. Gotcha. And when I got to Georgia State, I met a guy named Rob Clayton, an amazing drummer and a 
freaking even better singer. Um, he happened to play drums on the Hallow's Eve Monument record for which I toured in support of that record. So, Old circle fuckers. Yeah, man. I knew about him, and he knew about me, I guess, but we finally got to meet. And man became fast friends. We were just always hanging out. And then I kind of didn't see him a whole lot anymore. Might have been because of our schedules, but also because he had formed Skin Deep. And he got together with the other three dudes. And man, they took off like a rocket. They were all over the place and were freaking amazing. I saw them here in Atlanta in, I think, 1991 or 90 at one of our bigger venues and was just absolutely blown away by how good they sounded, how amazing they looked and was just like, Oh my God, I feel like I'm at a professional concert. I can't believe this is my peer. Right. Then they disbanded. And by now I had like moved back home, failed relationship, married, divorced, no kids, no property. So it was easy. It's a notary. And 30 days later, everything was fine. But <laughs> I, was, I was back home and like miserable. You, did, you get the first one out of the way. <laughs> yeah, dude. And just like an idiot, you know. And so I'm just kind of moping around. I had a job. And I got a call from Nick, the guitar player from Skin Deep. And he goes, hey, man, <clears throat> you want to you wanna, like reform with you? And Man, I was on fire again. I suddenly had a reason to exist. Right. And, you know, so he he didn't want me to tell anybody, though. And Rob Clayton called. He somehow figured it out. And he called me and he was like, hey, man, you playing with the, with the dudes from Skin Deep? And I was like, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, dude, that was Maybe. last time. The saddest part of this story, though, is that was the last time I ever talked to him. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, because, like, I don't know, within a year, he had joined a band called Deacon Lunchbox. You want to talk about 80s names? There's a 90s name for you. There Deacon you go. Deacon Lunchbox. But they were, they had traveled to somewhere to Alabama, I think, um, the day before Easter, Saturday. And on the way back, Sunday, Easter morning, they got hit. Rob was driving doing 70 miles an hour, got hit by a drunk driver coming the other direction, also doing 70. Nobody survived except the drunk driver. Ooh. And, and that's when the song Easter Morning was written, Skin Deep, Ooh. about that him. Sucks. So, yeah, and if you listen to the words, it, it kind of explains everything I just said, you know, right. from post viewpoint, you know, after the fact. And so, yeah, man, that's kind of how that happened. And then... We kept going. You know, the word was out. We started playing shows. Dallas's, Dallas Austin's brother, Claude, uh, who was at the time one of his scouts, he came out and saw our very first show at Avondale Town Cinema. I think it was October 22nd, if I'm not wrong about the date. Uh, 1992. Fuck you and your great memory. Hey, man. So, <laughs> important times, man. In my little career. And so, yeah, and that was the beginning of a glimmer in Dallas Austin's eye toward our band. Right. A couple of years later, he would sign Terrence, the singer, and then hire us as the backing band. And we we hit, that was our, I think it was one of those sessions that landed us all our very first legitimate album credit. Uh, we were the backing band for, for T. Smith. Terrence Smith, but they called him T. Smith. His artist name was T. Smith. Right. We ended, uh, a, like a B-side track on the Fled motion picture soundtrack. Uh, some old movie with one of the Baldwin brothers and, uh, gosh, was the guy that played Morpheus? Oh, uh, uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, I think it's Lawrence. I, I think it's him. Gosh, I could be wrong. Lawrence edit Fishburne all this, or edit all this shit out if it's wrong. <laughs> I feel, I ain't it shit. I, no, I feel bad that I can't remember it. Anyway, but yeah, you was could it open William up. Clarence III? No, I can't, dude. I, can't, I hate that I can't remember. I'm gonna fucking look this up later. But anyway, so fled motion picture soundtrack. We, you know, we you could open up the J card and see our your name. You know, our names were on that. It was our first credit. We were so proud of it, even though the movie didn't do anything and the record didn't sell jack. <laughs> it's a legitimate credit right but you did it we did it man and and that was the beginning and so 
um, I guess to kind of, even though you didn't ask, I'm going to kind of carry this forward oh. to present day because um, that was, again, Dallas saw that he could count on us, or I'm going to talk about me for a second. He could count I on always, me. I drum. always want you to talk about you. Oh, okay. But he could count on That's me. you're on my show, fucker. Thank you. And so, yeah, uh, I think the next time I got a call from him, other than to do more T. Smith songs, which we did plenty of those, um, was in 1996 to go to Nashville. We basically all moved to Nashville for that summer of 1996, and we recorded a whole, a whole album for Deborah Killings, which has never been released. And except I've got a copy of it and I listened to that thing and it's amazing. I hate that it was never released, but right. that, that was my first real like high paying session work for a professional label and a professional artist with an absolutely professional producer, Dallas Austin. Well, ho hold up. Time out. Uh, Skin Deep only has the one record, correct? That I played with. Um, the, well, the, yeah, that you played. On. Those songs on that compilation cd that you have had uh rob clayton is playing drums on i'm not on every track i'm only on like half of them some okay. of those tunes rob okay i i couldn't remember because one of my favorite songs on that record that you gave me is 10 miles to georgia that's that's when i was when the band that's me on drums that's when i was in the band i know motherfucker i know you're playing it's really scary that i know this <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever I whenever I hear Clayton's playing, I'm like, yeah, that ain't me. It, it was right. perfect. That guy's playing was perfect. Like, well, nothing. N I still can't play as perfectly as he did in the '80s. I'm just, <laughs> I hate it. I he was he was. So good. I don't hate him. I hate, I hate the fact that he play him. He was so freaking on and with just nothing but feel. Right, not a technical player. Didn't care. I mean, he, he, he could be technical, but he he didn't approach the drums that way. When I right. did all, I did. I was purely a technical player. Had no feel at all. So I was instantly attracted. But but even now, you know, thirty something years later, when I listen to the, to his tracks, I'm like, no, I, I wasn't wrong. That dude was magic. He he was perfect. And you listen to those tracks, and it's like, yeah, I had a, nailed. <laughs> No, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. There's there's a few drummers in my life um, that I feel that about. You're one of them, so go fuck yourself. Ah, um, you. And there's a guy up here named Max Maxwell. I feel the same way. I watch him play, and I'm like, man, fuck, I, just, I don't even want to play anymore. I get you. It, it's just, ugh. Anyway, yeah, okay, so fast forward. So you're, you're with Deborah Killings. Why didn't that record ever come out? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Is that one of them music industry for... things? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, and she, like, I I know her to this day, she, and, and worked with her many, many times after that. Um, and I never detected even a, an ounce of bad vibe. Like, I, I, I don't know why it never came out, but it was never a problem. She is probably one of the busiest singers in Atlanta. She is on everything. So she probably was like, well, shoot. I don't know how I'd get all this other work done if I was on the road supporting this record. I mean, that's, I mean that's a good point. She is all over the map um, and plays bass like nobody's business. I don't, I don't know if you know that, but she I can think play you bass. Told me that before. <laughs> I, I did a, I, I played with her for the entire year of 2003, and we were, we were touring all every weekend that summer, and at some point, we got together at Crossover Studios and recorded a, uh, a DVD of her show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she brought full production, and it looks really good, and it sounds, sounds really good, too. And uh, where was I going with that? Oh, she's playing the bass and singing lead, dude. All that yeah. stuff's on YouTube. If you, That's if crazy. you look up yeah. Deborah Killings Live, you'll find, and you'll see me with, like, hair as almost as short as yours, by the way. I, had a, I used to cut it with a one guard back then oh i've seen i've seen pictures of that yeah this, this so is I'm, my this is my it's almost summer so i've got a i can go down to the skin almost and then in about another two weeks i'll start shaving with a razor again i can't shave my head in the winter i look like i have fucking measles <laughs> yeah you don't want that no i don't need any help being any uglier i'm okay. good well, it only gets worse the older you get man fuck you i get better looking the older i get i wish i could say the same 
You can say the same. I could say uh, it, but it would be a lie. So let me rephrase. I wish I could say <laughs> it be true. Okay, I haven't given you one of these, and I give everybody on my show one. Oh, my God, you're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's brand new. See, that makes everything better, doesn't it? It does. It's just instantly I forgot about everything. See? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) I love you, fucker. Okay, so from the Deborah Killings thing, how did, and if I'm jumping too far ahead, let me know, how did the TLC thing come to be in existence? So, yeah, that with each new job from Dallas Austin, I think he, I hope, I don't really know this, I'm just guessing that he got i guess more and more comfortable with me as a session player i would say so because he called you for a lot of shit well it started to yeah it started to kind of avalanche for a little bit for a couple of years i was getting calls all the time and there was always new work to be done joy vega um cole the samantha ronson stuff we went out to la to one time to do work on pink but it it didn't happen that was one of those weeks where we just had a lot of fun (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Nobody got paid, but it was still fun. Anyway, um, who, by the way, is a fucking badass. Oh, to this Pink day. is such a badass. I saw yes. her last year here at the Yum Center. Oh, dude, fucking, oh, like, she's so good. It's amazing, bro. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Squirrel. And squirrel. And see. It just, it just, <laughs> it just all kind of. So, you know, Monica did the Monica tracks in, I think, late or no, early 98, I think. And then in late 98, I got a call to do the TLC Unpretty and went in and Alvin Spites was the mix engineer on the session. And I brought in my brown maple, Yamaha maple custom drums with the gold hardware because the white drums, I I don't know what they, I don't know. I didn't have the white drums yet. I was getting ready to say, I, I, for whatever reason, I actually remember this. You yeah. didn't get the white drums until you went on tour with it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Here I am forgetting my own history. So those were the best drums that I had at the time. And I used them everywhere. And so there you go. Anyway, we did that. And and then in February of the following year, 1999, the record came out. And I remember being in a in a movie theater. And they used to have this thing called movie tunes. Just popular music that would play before the mu- the movie started. Mm-hmm. And I remember Unpre- that. Unpretty came on uh, over the, over that sound system. And I, that was like, oh, wow. This is the first time I'd ever heard my drum tracks coming over a system that I wasn't controlling. <laughs> right. Know? Came like, out of nowhere. Right. It was somebody else's, you know, like it was kind of like the radio. And then, of course, I did hear it on the radio. And then they made a music video out of it and all this stuff. I wasn't in that, but who cares? That was my drumming you were hearing every time the song came on. And right. it, then it went gold, and the record sold five million. I mean, and I have the plaques to prove it. So, it's, Yes, you do. Yeah, man. You know, and amazing times. Man, I was very, very fortunate, very lucky. I, 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 I can't I, – I don't know how to say this. I, don't, I can't really take any credit. I just – I happen to be with the right people – when other right people were around. That's true, but you can also take some of the credit because I haven't said it on this episode yet, but you are a, a fucking monster player. And not only are you a monster player, you're a smart dude, and you know the phone rings, and you, speaking musically, of course, the phone rings and you have a, you get hired for a job. You have one fucking job to do, and you better do it well. Because if you do that, well that's going to lead to more jobs you're smart enough to know that you were smart enough then and you still know it now obviously mm-hmm. so I, I i think from the outside looking in even though i didn't know you then it, it's twofold you're a fucking monster player and when you get hired to do something you you laser focus and you get it done i definitely took first of all thank you for that but i'll, I'll follow up by saying i definitely took advantage of any situation that came my way i remember getting the call um, from Julian Wright, of all people. Um, driving around 285, I was working at Ken Stanton Music as a teacher. This was, I think, right around the same time I started at AIM. 94, 95, 96. And I got a call from Julian Wright. It was a pay, I had a pager. You know, and it goes off, and I look at the number, and it's Dallas Austin Studio. I'm like, oh, this is good. 
and Julian Rice says, hey, can you be in Nashville tomorrow <laughs> for Deborah Killings? And oh, by the way, you're going to live there. They're going to put you in a corporate apartment and you're going to be there the rest of the summer. Dude, I was in a band called Beehive. Uh, I was teaching full time or as full time as you could get at Ken Stanton Music. I had like 33 right. students or something like that. That's full time. I and I had to walk in there that day because I was heading there and I had to walk in that day and basically quit right then. Now, you could argue that from the Ken Stanton's perspective, I was a complete ass, you know, for, for bailing. Oh, there absolutely. was no way I was going to not do that. Like, it, the, first of all, the money was amazing. Secondly, look where it led. Like, if I had said no to that... I don't know, dude. That's one of those ethical dilemmas that every musician who hits it is going to face. Oh, Because absolutely. it never happens in a comfortable manner. It's always, can you be here tomorrow because the guy we were going to hire, I don't even know. See, that's the other thing. I don't know. if they Maybe they had another drummer lined up and that dude flaked. I, I don't know. Anything maybe it possible. was just my turn. I don't know, but I was not going to let that go. And I don't blame you. You obviously did the right thing. I mean, we, those that are close to me know, and I, I may have talked about it on the show. I don't remember, but that was the, um, it, I held on to it as a regret for a long time. And actually, this really smart dude I know, Tom Kniff, hmm. whatever his fucking name is. Oh, that would be you. Re educated me on the word regret. <laughs> And you were 100% right. So it, I don't look at it as a regret anymore. But for a long time, I, I regretted turning down Crossfade. Mm. It was one of those things that it, that it was kind of what you – granted, I don't know what it would have led to, but it was one of those opportunities that I should have taken. Mm -hmm. They had more going on than the band I was in, but we had shit going on too. So I went, I, I'm just going to stay here. And instead, I should have went, wait, because I was – literally looking at Matt Penfield standing 40 feet from me. Wow. And I, was, I fucking should have. Yeah. That he was their A&R guy. He worked for Columbia records and I should have taken it because it was an opportunity. And instead I didn't take it and I regretted it for a long time. But the reason I'm bringing that story up is because of what you just said. If you would have turned that down, if you would have turned that opportunity down and not, did what you did to Ken Stanton and all that other bullshit, who knows where you would be now? Yeah. And you got to take those opportunities. You can't be a putz like me and piss it away. I, and by the way, <clears throat> for anybody who's just, you know, hates me now for having done that, I will say we worked it out. Ken Stanton's students didn't, didn't miss a single lesson. Like I did those lessons that day and the rest of the week, I got one of the other teachers to, to handle it. Now, I'm sure there was a couple of kids that probably, you know, like, hey, man, where's Tom? You know, right. Well, that but, shit always happens. But the, the quality of the lessons didn't change because I think the other guys were every bit as good of a teacher as I could have been. And, um, and the band Beehive, now, <laughs> that did, those guys, they were like, they were on the fence. Like, some of them were like, dude, go take it man and then but the leader right. of the band the leader of the band bill buchanan he was the bass player in skin deep so we we had history anyway we kind of all got together and formed beehive nobody was doing anything after skin deep right and then all of a sudden i started working with dallas and and there was a little bit of a there was a little bit of an issue there um but you know the, again they kept going they got another drummer Dwayne holloway um good friend of mine they you did, and your they fucking did. names, you're killing me, Smalls. Dude, how you do you know, and remember just, all this shit? I don't know. I trust me. Half the time, I'm fishing for like the most common word. <laughs> but but I can remember a date, a phone number, a name. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know. Fair but, enough. Uh, I'll stop yeah. thinking on you. No, it's all good though. But you know, in, in other words. It, it seemed drastic, and you know Ken Stanton was was arguably upset. So were the guys. Some, well, Bill from Be Beehive, but everybody right. kept going. Nobody died. Nobody missed a beat. You know, and I my career trajectory completely went a different direction. You know, it was a different turn. Took you, a different. You got, you got to play Budokan, dude. I got to play Budokan. 
You got to play Budokan. And for those of you listening that don't know what Budokan is, fucking Google it. We'll wait. Yeah, dude, that was mad. The best part about Japan, my, I, I've, I've been twice. That was the first trip, 1999, 20 years ago. Um, best part about that trip was Hagi. Hagi, Takashi Hagiwara is the founder of the Yamaha drum division. And he's not with them anymore, but at the time, he was. And he just happened to be in Tokyo that week, and that's really rare. He was always all over the place. Right. And he didn't apparently live very far from wherever we were staying. So he would come and pick me up every morning, as long as we didn't have anything to do. And when you go to Tokyo for one show like that, mm-hmm. you get there a week early just to get acclimated to the time. Right. So there wasn't shit to do for three, four days. <laughs> <laughs> and he would come get me every morning and take me all over the place. Like even if there were Ubers and, you know, you had, you know, back then or lifts, you wouldn't have known where to go. Right. You got somebody who grew up there, who lives there, to take you all the magical places, the best food, and then pay for all of it. Ooh. Oh, my God. He, he was a fan of watches. And I heard about this about him. And so, of course, he took me watch shopping. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's nice. That's nice. And the next day, there was a box on the drums, and it was the watch. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. You know? Of course, of course oh you still God, have it. Oh, my God, yes. You know? Um, ah, dude, it was, it was just it was wonderful. One time, Lisa Lopez, left eye, for those people who only know that name, she figured out what was going on. She was like, you're leaving every day where are you going i'm like oh dude yeah the guy that makes my drums you know the white ones that you ordered (laughs) by the way she was the one that wanted white drums i just have to go on record and say i have white drums because of lisa you remembered okay good she was the one (laughs) she was the one that that had everything to do with set design something else a lot not a lot of people know Mm. so yeah i'm like the guy that designed your drums and she was like, can I go? Like, come on. So one of those days, it was me and Hoggy and Lisa. Oh, very cool. Yeah, man. That's, that's cool as shit. That's the best part of that trip. Budokan was awesome. Playing with TLC, out of this world. Right. But being carted around by the guy that makes your drums. I'm sorry. It, there's, 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 that's another level. The true. next best, the I next best can't thing. Can't really argue with that. That's pretty fucking true. <laughs> I'm gonna throw one more out there. Um, Yutada Hikaru was an artist, one of the artists that were opening up for us. Mm-hmm. You do you know who was playing drums for that artist? I don't. Oh, of course, I would not know that. Vinny Kaliuta, and the fuck out of here. We got oh, oh, dude, we got along famously. Like hung out with them all night after the show at our hotel you stand at our hotel nice dude and 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 and, uh, i don't know if he remembers this but he was like where are you from pennsylvania no wonder you play the way you do Uh, you know (laughs) apparently he's from there maybe something like that pittsburgh pennsylvania somewhere in the northeast i don't know i think he's from northeast somewhere yeah and and we just God, we talked for hours and like an idiot, I didn't, I, I have a photo with us. I did have the wherewithal to get somebody to take a photo of the two of us. Right. Neither, neither of us look like we do now, but. Oh no. <laughs> but it's a photo. And, uh, but I, I was there. I, I really mm-hmm. wished I, you know, I had thought about getting him cause I have, I have a uh, tour poster from Japan here with me right now. And it's got all the artists on it. And I wish I'd have gotten everybody to sign it. Monica oh, yeah, was that, one that of would have been That would have been cool as shit. All three girls to sign it from TLC. Monica to sign it. Utada. Vinny. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> that That would be cool as shit for sure. But no, I, I'm an idiot. I didn't do any of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to argue with you on this. And I don't argue a whole lot. But you're not an idiot. You played Budokan. You still win. Okay, thanks. Cool. I'll take that. Have an eighth note. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take that eighth note. Have an eighth note. <laughs> <laughs> Another inside joke. That's great. I, well, I, I figure there's going to be about 12 people that'll get the eighth note joke, and then it will take them a, a, a good two or three weeks for everybody else to figure out what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, 
So when you started teaching at AIM, did were you still going out on the road and all that shit, or did you just kind of settle in at AIM? Was, see, the, was well, the whole TLC thing over with? No. See, when I started at AIM was about the same time Skin Deep ended. This is 1994. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha, so gotcha, gotcha. I didn't. I hadn't even started recording with, or maybe I just started recording with Dallas. Maybe those those lines are a little fuzzy, but but uh, but yeah, you know, early to mid '90s started teaching at AIM, and I only had one class, and it it took years for that to develop into anything more than just that one class. Right. I th- I seem to remember you telling me that because it's. Obviously, a lot of your AIM history is I, – I know mo- – actually, I know most of your history from beans in your office forever in a day with Randy Hoexter. <laughs> Hoextra. Yep. Yeah, he is fucking Hoextra. He is Hoextra. How is Randy anyway? Is he good? He's, he's apparently so, yeah. I chat with him about once a year. I hate to say that, but that's just – you know. We, we, you know what I mean? You, it is sometimes what it you is, just dude. lose touch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But but whenever we get together, it's like nothing changed, it, which uh, is cool. It is what it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is cool. It is what it is. But anyway, I know most of your history at AIM, so um, I, I couldn't remember what you told me if you were if you did the AIM thing before and after TLC or just after TLC. I couldn't remember. It was both, and I I had to fight for my job after the tour when I got back, or I should say this. When I knew we were hitting the road, right? I, I had lined up a, a sub that I pulled him aside and I said, "Look, you have to know that when this tour is over, I'm coming back. I'm not going to let you be the sub if you aren't okay with this." Right. <laughs> now, whether or not I had any real right to say that, I don't know, but I—that's what I was saying because I didn't, you know, I—I'm not an idiot. We don't. Nobody tours forever, okay? Right. I get it, and I wasn't trying to, you know, just give away all my money at home but when i got back i gotta have something to come back to well right and we knew when the thing was going to be over it's not like it was like up for debate this is the end of the show that the the last show is going to be you know on this date unless anything else crops up which did not happen right so we we knew when it was going to be over and uh but when when i got back it seemed like everybody forgot our agreement I mean, I even had Knight Driscoll, the president of AIM, in on these conversations, and he was more than happy with it. He, because to him, he thought, well, this is going to be great. I'll have the guy that you know played on the TLC tour teaching here. That's going to make us look good. Right. I had to remind him of that when I got back. I'm like, dude, why am I not getting any of this, these classes back? What's what's going on? I mean, we, we had an agreement. We didn't sign anything, but we didn't think we had to. Right. And so agreement. Right. So so for several months, maybe a year or two, even um, I was just doing open counseling classes. They just basically said, "Okay, well, we're just going to add four hours and call it open counseling and you can teach those. And then I think Knight started having me do instructional videos, which was the beginning of the whole instructional video thing for me, by the way. Right. I was just setting up a camera at home and some simple little mics and a small mixer and creating instructional, you know, 10 minute instructional videos for like every song in rock performance and in jazz performance. Oh, no, I didn't know you. Wait, yes, yeah. I did. I, re- I remember that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. There you were like me VHS tapes, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was another way he was trying to compensate for my not having any classes. Right. And then eventually you just took over that motherfucker. Well, I can't remember yeah. exactly. I can't remember exactly <laughs> what happened. I think I like oh, how you paused, well, going wait. I kind of well, did, to, didn't I? I had to, yeah. No, it's what ended up happening was the guy that I hired. I think he, I think he got a gig somewhere, and then Chip Lunsford, who was one of the original drum faculty guys, he left AIM to start what he called event performance, which is a band, a company that basically had a, a, several bands that he would hire out. He right. wanted to step out and be, be his own boss. Right. All of a sudden, man, like 16 classes opened up and I got a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, it wasn't any, anything I did. And it, and it, it was literally like, it could have gone any other direction. Had chip not left, it wouldn't have happened. Had that other guy that I hired as a sub, had he not left, it wouldn't have happened. Right. 
again, this is why I always say I can't really take any credit. Most of the success in my world has happened because of just a variety of quantum level circumstances. Uh, who knows? You just – so my advice to anyone, even though there's, no one's asking <laughs> – <laughs> as a result is to go where the wind blows man like there's it's okay it's okay to just observe and embrace the winds of change it it has always worked for me it's how i got into vo it's how i got into to video production it's how i got into everything i've ever done is right. just one with what felt right no, uh, there's there's a shit ton of truth in that because you know my history. You know I'm a um, a borderline gypsy. I mean, I've Louisville's the longest place I've lived anywhere in my fucking life. I've been here 12 years last month, which is shocking. Yes, Tom, it has been 12 years since I lived in Atlanta with you. Yep. God. 12 fucking years. Yeah, brother. that makes no sense at all. I- <laughs> That's not even true. It doesn't, it doesn't work. But what I'm saying, though, is, I mean, I lived in North Carolina, South Carolina. I lived in Florida. I lived in Georgia. I almost lived in Tennessee. I moved here, and then I moved there, and then I, and I've and i lived in a million cities in all of the other places. I came from New York. So I, I get that. It's I'm all about going with the wind, like you said, and it's – I think there's something to be said for – the different levels of success and also the different levels of happiness. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Cause like if you look at you and I on paper, since it's you and I having a conversation it, success wise, you're way more successful than I am, but happiness wise, we're about even, which is you, what matters. Right. That's, and that's what I was getting at. That's what matters. I mean, I've done some really, really cool shit. You've done some really, really cool shit, but we're both happy. We both don't have any issues. We have a long line of haters, though. I'm just saying. <laughs> Do we? I don't. Maybe I, I don't know. Do you have haters? For everybody out there, he's nodding his head. Yes. He's not saying it, but he's saying yes. Oh, I have haters. If I have I haters, have dude, I have. Motherfuckers that hate me. I, I don't. I would never say that I don't. I just am completely and totally unaware of them. Like, if they're out there, I have no idea. I'm unaware of them from their standpoint. I'm aware of them because people tell me. That makes sense. They tell you about their about your haters. Oh yeah, man! Dude, I, check out I, what I heard this week. I never. <laughs> I swear to God, I never hear anything like that about my. I, now this yeah, could be because of my world. I was about to say it could be my narrow focus, constant, just introspective figuring out whatever the hell is wrong with me that day and trying to fix that, <laughs> you know, that no, I don't, yeah, I, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with you and you're not in a, not, it's not a, um, it's I not don't a think they're not out there. I just don't have any experience with them. Right. I was going to say, it's not a narcissistic thing, but you're, you're very self-absorbed in what you have going on. I'm just, just not, yeah, not I'm only do you have your businesses and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you have a wife and three boys and all that kind of shit too. Yep. You ain't got time for that shit. Any number of of bosses, you know, whether you know, because VO clients especially, um, they they hit you from all angles and sometimes all at once. Oh, so, for sure. You know, yeah. And then, like I say, I do have a quote unquote day gig. It's it's a marketing position for a software development company. But he's a friend of mine. I've known him my entire life. Right. I mean, we used to ride bikes together. So it's really just. He saw what I was doing at AIM, and he was like, hey, if you ever want to do that for me, just let me know. And when I was ready to leave AIM, I called him up and said, hey, man, is that deal still good? Yep. All right. Cool. How much? Yeah. Good. All right. <laughs> and I that mean, was it. it. Like, it was, like, literally happened in five minutes over the phone. And I just basically, you know, bounced from one job to the other and just kept doing the same thing. Right. You know, just, but for a different product. Right. <laughs> Right. No, it, uh, it it makes sense because you you've always had your hands in some sort of marketing, uh, whether it be VO that you do now or audio or visual or whatever. Yeah, there was always some creative element. The only thing that I do now that doesn't have an ounce of creativity to it would be this gymnastics shit that I started a year and a half ago. I I you know I've always worked out. 
like always been involved in some kind of fitness regimen. Oh, oh, I'm with you. I'm with you. But, I'm with you. I'm with you. But about a year and a half ago, that actually turned a corner and hit. It went from calisthenics to gymnastics proper. Like I started getting coaching and buying the requisite textbooks, literally on and on doing hobbies. handstands on the wall. Yeah, or not on the wall. You know, that <laughs> is going to take that takes forever. Like it's not even a strength thing. It's a balance thing. And your body just doesn't know what to do. We lived as long as we have. The body has no idea what to do when it's upside down. And so, you know, True. first I thought, well, I'm not strong enough. That's that's not it. I quickly gained the strength to hold my body weight upside down, but it's a balance issue. It's and it's way harder. I can't believe it's as hard as it is. And this is the thing I love to say about it, is that it makes drumming look like a walk in the park. It's so much easier to learn to play drums, or it was than this will ever be. Good grief. I mean, some of this stuff I've been doing for a year and a half, and it's not even close well, to does that it to be. Does that mean that Tommy Lee is way cooler than we think he is because he can play drums upside down? <laughs> no, because he's strapped in. <laughs> no, he is cool. But he's still upside down. I'm kidding. No, he is. He's First of all, he's cool no matter what, right? That guy is like the Tommy definition of cool. fucking Lee. You know. Dope. Come on, man. Oh, but no, way, I, you know what comes out this Friday on you Netflix? Mean, you mean tomorrow? I'm all over it. I have an alarm on my phone to remind me to tune in. The fuck are you talking about? The fucking Motley Cruth story. Right. Okay. I was like, talking no. about, I already knew what you were saying. We're, oh. we're, how did you get, how did you drift off that? Because I'm looking at my clock going, tomorrow's Thursday, you fuck. Movie comes well, out as far Friday. as I'm con- as far as I'm concerned, it's already Friday. It feels like <laughs> you know, fucking midnight. Stacy was asking me. She said, "You want to have a viewing party?" And I went, "Nope." She said, "Why not?" I said, "Because I don't want any motherfucker talking to me when I'm watching this." That's movie. exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> damn right. In fact, but but it's Netflix. You can watch it whenever you want. I I plan on yeah. I plan on seeing that thing like when when no one's around. Right. I said at the beginning of this, I, I one of my favorite stories to tell is how I met you. Oh. And uh, I'm going to tell you this story, even though I've told it to you before. It's been a long time. When I went to AIM, I had to audition, and I auditioned for Craig. And I had to take the three-week preliminary reading course or two-week preliminary reading course, however long it was, because I couldn't read for shit. I didn't know what any of those motherfuckers were. <laughs> I had no clue, um, which is part of the reason why I tattooed them on my knuckles. So there was an open house or something after I did the audition and you were playing and I don't remember who you're playing with because none of that is relevant. Hmm. I just remember sitting there and I left and I got in the car and my ex-wife asked me what I thought. And I said, I can't go to this school. And she said, why? And I said, because I'm not fucking good enough. I'm not playing drums in front of that fucking dude that just played. No. Happened. Fucking no way. No how. And I'll never forget that because it, I was, it wasn't even an intimidation thing. It was that realization of, I thought I had done some cool shit and I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't have a fucking clue till I watched you play. Oh man! And then the second part of that story is, well, obviously once I got over that because I went to the school. Yeah. I had picked, and you and I have talked about this a hundred times. I had picked up the vibe that a lot of people started going to aim. Because of let me rephrase that, a lot of drummers started going to aim because of you, because you were the drummer for TLC and Monica, and you've done all this shit, and they wanted to. I'm doing air quotes, kids. They wanted to ride your coattails and see what you could do for them, and I specifically remember making a point to not give a fuck about you. <laughs> <laughs> remember when we talked about that? Yes, I do. Because I, I walked the first that. time I walked in your office and you had all those those platinum records. I remember. T- don't give a fuck about this guy. Don't give a fuck. Don't say anything stupid. Ask him your question and get the fuck out of his office. <laughs> you know, the problem with those kinds of thoughts are, okay, don't think of a purple giraffe. Right. <laughs> Too late, motherfucker. Too late, you know, motherfucker. Some of those, some, some, those kinds of kind of self-contradictory ideas. I, but I, I know, which I'm, I'm, I'm being funny, but, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you're just like, okay, look. Yeah, let's let's stick to the script here. Let's let's get right. this job done. And 
Plus, there's something cool about, right, about not, it, I'm speaking for you now, you know, something cool about not doing what everybody else is doing. I mean, oh, you know. Well, yeah. You're always, you know, an outlier. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always been that way, but I, there was there was something ab- about. I'm not know. saying, by the way. Let me just. I need to interject this. I'm not saying that everybody was trying to ride my coattail. <laughs> I'm I'm not definitely not saying that. I don't. Oh, know. I'll say it because I was there. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if a lot of motherfuckers people, wanted to get close to you. If they were, if they if they had that going on, I they kept it from. They hid it pretty well because I was completely clue or I, maybe i was just clueless that's also possible i think you were clueless to the to the nonchalant ones but you you had to know of a few of them in fact i know you do because you and i talked about a couple of them once we became friends but that's irrelevant the point i'm getting at is i knew that i had one shot to not fuck that up <laughs> and what i mean by that is because i had done everything so late because you probably forgot about this I didn't go to AIM until I was 29. Right. Uh, yeah, I think we figured fu- that out. Yeah. It's fucking late. I mean, I started everything fucking late. So I had to make sure that, one, I acted like an adult. But two, and more importantly, that I didn't fuck up any possible relationship because I didn't know what it would gain me or gain the other person down the road. Because I was the same way with Craig. Like, when I saw Craig play, I went, oh, fuck. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. I'm so out of my league in this place. Um, best place. Well, but that just means the money is, I would presume, that means the money is being you know well spent. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, absolutely. You want you want people that you want to be surrounded by people who are just way. I, that's what I always wanted. Oh no, it it was, but it was it was also that intimidation factor of I I've never played a lesson or never had a lesson in my life and then it's the arrogance factor of a month ago i was in front of ten thousand people in right. virginia i don't know how to fucking mentally wrap my head around all this shit that had a well, lot to do with it huh? you had you know a good 10 12 years on your side when i went through that i was you know barely 20 right when i went from you know big fish in a small pond to nobody in an ocean Right. You know, it, it's it's nuts how all that happens. But wh- I think one of the reasons why it's my favorite, one of my favorite stories to tell about you is because you and I ha- always had that kind of standoffish, yet there's something about you I fucking dig relationship at uh, until we became actually became friends. You know what I'm you, saying? Yeah, you, I remember you, yeah, you definitely did not act like any of the other kids. And I mean, Hexter thought you were cool from the beginning, and that guy is suspicious of everybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like so if and he's a very good judge of character. That's the other thing. Um, he has good reason to be suspicious. I don't have that gift. I don't have that talent. That dude right. can like literally meet somebody and instantly describe every ounce of their personality and be right about it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's really good at that. Shit. Oh my god, I'm. St- I wish I had even just a little bit of that. I don't. And but yeah, he liked you from the beginning. I mean, all the people who I trust trusted you, so that made it easy. I mean, not right. that I didn't. I'm just and not that I needed their confirmation, but yeah, you yeah. Every once in a while somebody comes through the school who just you just who just gets it. You were one of them. Uh, another guy before you um, was John Chismar. He ended up being my drum tech on the TLC tour. He was a student at AIM. Right. I, I, I know of him from you talking about him, but I've never got to meet him. He's, he died last year, sadly. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, totally. Oh, I, I saw that post. Yep. That, that's right. Um, but my point is that maybe once every 10 years, you know, somebody like you, you guys would come along. And it's, it's rare, but we recognize them right away. It's like, oh, look at that. Okay, he's one of us. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you were instantly indoctrinated into the camp. Instantly. And we made you buy fucking coffee as a result. <sighs> it's so fucking true. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Again. My, yeah, again. No, my favorite was I'd 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 be running late and I'd kind of like I don't even know how to describe it. I, where your 
in the old building where your office was, I had to walk by it yeah. constantly. And there was really nowhere to fucking hide. And I would try to skate past your office and nope. you'd wait till I opened that fucking performance room door. Where's my bean? God damn it. <laughs> How does he fuck? He, he had his back to the door. How did he see me? How the fuck did he see me? And, I don't know. That's just too funny. Oh, I will never forget that. You want to go time. get a bean? Oh, it was awesome. Who's driving? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was always me, you, Pat, or Hexter. Yep. It was always the, the three of us and or the four of us. And he used to, and Hexter used to make fun of us for the way we would poke the straw through the top, you know, the lid, mm -hmm. until one day he spilled his doing it his way. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's what You're he like, gets for making fun yeah. of us. That's That needs to be chopped out of this fucking episode. That was... A, a really boring remembrance but nonetheless it was the first thing i thought of when you brought that up because then the, the other the other thing here's another boring remembrance it was always a toss of a coin is it dunk or star or bucks uh you are correct there was always that so so it was really a, a, a kind of a matrix of decisions who's driving who's buying where the fuck are we going <laughs> Oh, and let's not forget that most of the time we only had about a 15 to 20 minute window. <laughs> Which didn't matter because we, <laughs> the prisoners ran the fucking joint. You understand? Well, by the by the time I was going to get coffee with you guys, yeah, I, I, I was, what are you going to fucking do to me? <laughs> you must, I'm going to say, you must have known, you must have known that like you were just going to be graduating with honors no matter what. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> now, wait. Let's not get the wrong impression. I worked my fucking ass off, Mister. He did. Let, let's let's clear the air. We let's, didn't. We showed no favoritism outside the bean. Well, except that one thing. But well, we won't uh, talk about that. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, I busted my ass, and the reason I bring you all did. that up, the reason, thank you, the reason I bring all that up is because I owe it to you and to Craig for making me a better drummer. I was good when I got there. Okay, I was okay when I got there. All right, I was decent when I got there. <laughs> sure, man, absolutely. But you guys made me much, much better. And I, I uh, on my show, thank you very much for that. Wow, well, happy, happy to, happy to have helped. Well, that you got, you got a good friend of it because we have had some massive conversations, sir. Most of them have been just like this, just not recorded. Sadly, you're right. There's a lot of fucking truth in that. You're right. Maybe I mean, we should just start recording everything. Yeah. I was going to say, it might be good that some of them weren't. It depends on what we said. Again, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did, did I cover everything you, uh, you wanted to cover? I don't know. Did you? Do you feel like you left anything out? I don't think so. Uh, what, where can everybody find you? Oh, well, so... That's kind of important. Instagram. Shit. Instagram. Look at that. Look at that. To... Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's. You know what that is? Fingernail. Now, besides that, why it's so short? Because uh, you clipped them. No. Good guess. I had to clip it after I fucking went to catch a crash. <laughs> right on the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You did the whole. You, had, you, did, you, you did the. the the kind of crash catch with the same hand that you hit it with. Yeah, those are always the most dangerous ones. And those yeah. are the ones I use the most, and I really need to stop using it because I'm getting fucking old. <laughs> I can't move my hand as fast as I used to. I don't remember the last time I did one of those. I should I should reintroduce those into my playing. Anyway, um... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you just ask me a question? I don't even remember what it was. I, I love you so much. See, that's how late it is. <laughs> I know. I love you so much. Um, no, where's all? Where can everybody find all you? Oh, shit? right, right, right. Okay, so, so Instagram. I used to have two different accounts: one for VO, one for drums. Now I just have one that's just me, and it's everything's on it. And that would be my full name, Tom Lee Knight. Now you spell Lee like a girl. L E I G H. So Tom, not Tommy Lee, like as in the drummer we were just talking about, but I do have the middle name Lee. So Tom Lee Knight, that's the Instagram handle. And 
I'm on Facebook, but I'm hardly ever on there. That seems to be just a bunch of curmudgeons bitching about fucking politics and get off my lawn crap. So I have a hard time with that. That uh, you platform. see this? Look at yeah, you dude. Screen. I see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally. How I fucking feel. Yeah, I got no time at all for for any negativity and all no. that. I'm just I'm trying to no. live in the moments and you know imagine a better universe. Um. So yeah, I don't. I don't. Oh, I don't you mean you're Facebook. delusional. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, definitely utopianistic <laughs> and wishful thinking and everything else. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though. It feels better than even the lamest flame war that I see constantly on Facebook. No, no, I never see that stuff on Instagram. It's Instagram seems to be just a, a, a world of love and helping uh, other people. And it's just cool. I mean, yeah, you I got just, your. I just you had this. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just had this conversation literally the other day about how. And you and I actually talked about this a few months ago, but I, I'm I'm really doing it now. I I'm starting to really fucking love Instagram. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, it, it because it's so drama free. Yes, exactly right. I love. Look, here's a picture of my foot. Here's a picture of my food. Here's a picture of my drums. Here's a video of me singing. Hey, life's fucking great. I I love it so much. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you you know, people. Yeah, the curmudgeons love to hate on it because of all those things, but that's oh, actually yeah. what I like about it is that I don't have to hear you complaining mm. about whatever it is you're always complaining about. No, 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 no. I'm here to try and enrich my life, share said enrichment with others. I don't care. No, I don't about either. your political views. Sorry. And I'm, I'm not sorry, here to talk not about sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah, sorry. I, seriously. Yeah, I just, I don't mean to... Now I sound like a curmudgeon, bitching about the curmudgeons, but I, I just... I'm so done with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so anyway, I, I get it, dude. I get it. So yeah, so that's my Instagram. Um, I have a website, but it's only for the music. I mean, for the VO stuff, and that's Tom Knight Voice, Sans middle name, just TomKnightVoice.com. And I haven't updated it in months. Ugh, I'm so ashamed and embarrassed by that. But um, those are the two probably best places i i have a youtube account i forget what it's called who cares uh, i'm never on it i'm never on that either you know which is terrible i really ought to be much more active on that platform especially i mean for god's sakes i have a an incorporated video production company since 2001 mm -hmm. before youtube was even a thing mm -hmm. and and yet i still don't i still don't i'm still not on that platform anywhere near as much as that <clears throat> as, lame. You, as, as you've used to say to me when I was in school and I was your student, don't be an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that backfired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the saying, I'm the idiot. I'm the idiot. But you I know did. what? You're you're my idiot and I love you. Oh, I love you too, brother. <laughs> <laughs> It just got weird. Dude. What do the people? What do people think of you? This is great. I love it. Oh, dude! I, I, uh, when I, when I set out to start the show, I said I wouldn't do interviews. I would just have conversations. Well, you're doing it. This is great, man. This oh, has been thanks. very comfortable. Yeah, it's totally thanks. cool. Well, I, I, I want it to be. Hours? God. Yeah, almost three hours. I told you. Yep. Now, granted, by the time I edit out all the shit that we can't fucking talk about, oh, good and the secret stuff that I couldn't talk about, it'll be shorter shorter not much shorter but it'll be shorter <laughs> well, you definitely let me know i can't wait to listen to it again from a listener's perspective it's always different when you listen back to it a wise man once told me that hmm. thank you in fact i think he told me that about an hour ago <laughs> i've already forgotten see maybe because there wasn't a date attached to it there was no date <laughs> that's what it was and there i didn't put a name on it either yeah <laughs> dude i love your face thank you love for face, being brother. my friend thank you yeah, for man. for all the lessons you gave me and again thank you thank you for my voiceover for of my show i appreciate it anytime man anytime and uh that is it we are out of here and uh i'm gonna hang up on you now and i love your face and i'll talk to you soon all right brother love you too see you man see you normally this would be where I'd say, well, that's it, kid, because <laughs> I'm a fucking retard, but I'm not going to do that. I am an idiot. That's right. Tom calls me an idiot. I officially am an idiot. 
but you guys already know I'm an idiot, which I think is why you listen to my show. I'm not real sure. I completely forgot to ask Tom about his mentorship he had with Don LaFontaine. And if you don't know who Don LaFontaine is, Don LaFontaine was often referred to as the voice of God. And Tom, being the gentleman and the awesome fucking human that he is, was nice enough to send me this. Okay, Don LaFontaine. So for those who don't recognize that name or already know who he is, Don LaFontaine was the movie trailer voiceover king undisputed um, up until he died in 2008. I can't believe it's been over a decade. But um, I had my, and still have, Nighttime Studios Incorporated, the dumbly named production house that that I still have after almost two decades. At any rate, I was trying to just add some power and gravitas, I guess is what they say, um, to my demos. And I thought, what better way than to have that one voice that you hear on all the movie trailers that is so profound. Well, he they also call him the voice of God. So I was like, why not have the voice of God on my demo? So I reached out to him through his info at donlafontaine.com. He had a website and, you know, those info at addresses rarely, for me anyway, ever went anywhere. You know, you never heard anything back. And I kind of didn't really expect anything different <laughs> on this go route. But just in case, I introduced myself and was just told my story. And I believe that I can meet anybody I want to meet. I mean, I, I don't mean that to sound like pompous and arrogant or anything. I just always feel like, well, why not, right? I mean, I'm, he's a dude and I'm a dude. What? What's the deal? I mean, I did the same thing in high school. I would just walk up to any chick that I wanted to date and ask her out when a lot of guys would be too afraid to. I was like, what do I have to lose? I mean, worst she can, she can say is no. And then I'm right back where I was five seconds ago before I asked. But what if she says yes? And by the way, I got a lot of yeses for being a, an ugly glasses wearing brace face, skinny, long haired drummer. Really, I could have just said drummer. <laughs> but you add all those other things. And, and yet I still got yeses. That stuck with me. And Anyway, I'm getting off track here, but bottom line is a couple of months later, I get an email from his agent. Basically, he had read the email and kind of pitched it over to his agent and says, oh, you know, see, why don't you see what you can do to hook this guy up? Because the agent's email said, hey, Don wants to do this. He sent this over to me with instructions to cut you a good deal. And I'm like, okay, cool. Great. Wow. First of all, he read it. Secondly, he wants to do it. Cool. And give me a good deal? Well, what's what's a good deal? I don't even know what this stuff normally costs. I mean, in my video production days, I would have paid professional VO talent, you know, $500 or $1,000 for reads. But this was the movie trailer king. Well, sure enough, she comes back saying, hey, well, you know, we need to see a script first to know what the rate is going to be. So I basically wrote a very fast version of a script that I, I mean, it took me no time to write it. And I think it was about a minute and a half. And I basically just thought, okay, what are all the things that I would want to hear that guy say? And I wanted to make it to where I could maneuver the pieces around to fit whatever story I wanted to tell. Really what I'm looking for is a bunch of sound bites that I can piece together and, and make several different demos out of if I want to. And so she came back and she was like, Okay, this would cost you 8250 bucks. I think was the, the price, which was way out of my league, right? So I wrote back and I said, look, I, I just got married. Um, I could, gosh, I could probably slam 1000 bucks on a credit card. And oh, by the way, if you're still reading this, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm imagining them seeing $1,000 and like quickly hitting delete, right? And a couple of days goes by and I didn't hear anything. And I was like, well, that's, yeah, that was a fun ride while it lasted. And then all at once, I got this email directly from Don, not his agent. And it said, Tom, all the best, Don. And he had provided the entire script free of charge. I, I was over the moon. I'm still over the moon about it. What? Okay, so 8250 bucks, the voice of God. And he did it to, for as a wedding gift? Wow. So... The story continues, if you're interested, 
It didn't take long for me to cut his VO into a demo that I had already basically finished. And I sent him a copy of it, and his response was, wow, this is amazing, we need to work together. Whoa, even more over the moon, right? So what did we start doing? We basically rebuilt his website. Now this is like 12 or 13 years ago at this point. He would read, he would read anything I asked uh, him to read in, in an effort to kind of help me understand what he was doing. So uh, he took me under his wing in a lot of ways. And we, we talked at great length about family, marriage, interracial marriage. He was married to a black woman and they had uh, a couple of girls, beautiful women who are now amazing singers, by the way. They all have a voice. Isn't that interesting? All right. I'm digressing as usual. Let me get back on track. Suffice it to say, we did start working together. And in return for, you know, him reading anything I wanted him to read or answering questions about the industry or just, hey, how do you sound like you sound? <laughs> you know? um, in return for that, I did all kinds of web work for him. So, so me and a, a couple of friends of mine who I work with still today rebuilt his website and we started a constant contact campaign, a, a recurring e-zine that was basically him telling his story each week or however often he sent those things. And he had several thousand subscribers and he would just send me an email with sound bites or video clips. Uh, at some point he actually mailed a big box full of VHS tapes and beta tapes from huge campaigns uh, that he had voiced. And we would put together these weekly e-zines and then I'd send them out to the masses. Man, it was too much fun. Uh, and then sadly he died in 2008, right after my first son was born. It was, uh, it was an amazing couple of years and I treasure all those emails. I mean, I still sometimes will just do a search for Don LaFontaine in my email and just kind of go back and reread all that stuff and the, the wisdom and the friendliness. I mean, the guy was, he was one of the nicest people I ever didn't meet in person. I never met him in person, but he was one of the nicest people that I ever had the pleasure of knowing. Let's put it that way. So yeah, that's my Don LaFontaine story. Hey guys, this is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I have a podcast called Fascination Street, and it allows me to bring to my listeners some of the most fascinating stories and guests. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be, an Academy Award-winning actor, a platinum-selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Well, that's it, kids. That's the show for the week. I hope you guys dug it. I know it was a long one. Thank you for hanging in there. But there was just too much good stuff that Tom and I had to talk about. Uh, I really do love that dude. He is an awesome human. He helped me not only as a drummer, but as a human. He He's a good dude. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't need to tell you anything more because if you're listening to the end of this, that means you made it all the way through and you have figured out for yourself that Tom is fucking awesome. Now, I did forget to tell one story that is actually pretty funny. There was one bean trip, and if you were paying attention, you'll know what that means, between Tom and I that actually turned into me helping him with a very short video project that he was working on that led us to T-Boz's house. T-Boz, who is one of the singers for TLC, lives in Atlanta. 
So I ditched two of my classes and went to T-Boz's house with my instructor and hung out with her while he did his video project. And it was fucking awesome. She could not have been any cooler, super down to earth, super, super nice lady. And me being the heavy coffee drinker that I am, I, of course, had to use the restroom. So when we got back to AIM, the running joke for a couple weeks was we went to T-Boz's house and I pissed in her toilet. I know, it's not the coolest story ever. It is kind of funny because the picture I had Tom take, that day I was wearing a shirt that said spooning leads to forking. And I'm standing with T-Boz from TLC like a fucking just idiot with a spooning leads to forking t-shirt. Maybe that's why I don't wear message tees anymore. Hmm, could be something to it. Anyway, I hope you got something out of this episode. I hope you dug it. Make sure you check out all of Tom's stuff. You do hear him every week on my show. You already know this, but go check out his drumming. Go check out his voiceover stuff. Check out his website and all that shit. He really is an awesome dude. I hope you guys got some laughs. Uh, It's great to have friends like him, not for what he can or cannot do for me, but just because he's a genuine dude. Tom, I love your face, and I am out of here. And as I say at the end of every episode, go do some shit. Seriously, beat it. Get the fuck out of here. Go learn a new skill. Go figure out how to do voiceovers. You'll never be as good as Tom, but you can give it a hell of a go. Like that? That was fucking horrid. But I'm going to leave it in there. I love your faces. Tom, I love your face. I will see you guys, or I will talk to you actually I don't really talk to anybody I talk to a microphone so it's just kind of fucking weird and that's it I'm out of here I got nothing that's it see you later so until next time I will talk at you soon